Het Octoweis, the Dutch title of this book, refers to that part of the building which served as a hiding place for the two families who took shelter there between 1942 and 1944. Octer means behind or in back of, and Wies is Dutch for house. In Amsterdam's old buildings, the apartments overlooking a garden or court may be divided from those overlooking the street, thus providing two separate suites within the same apartment. Het Octawies, or literally the house behind, is situated on the Prinsengracht, one of the city's canals. To simplify the English text, we have called that part of the house the secret annex, although it is not an annex in the proper sense of the word. Eleanor Roosevelt provided the introduction to this book. She writes, This is a remarkable book written by a young girl, and the young are not afraid of telling the truth. It is one of the wisest and most moving commentaries on war and its impact on human beings that I have ever read. Anne Frank's account of the changes wrought upon eight people hiding out from the Nazis for two years during the occupation of Holland, living in constant fear and isolation, imprisoned not only by the terrible outward circumstances of war, but inwardly by themselves, made me intimately and shockingly aware of war's greatest evil, the degradation of the human spirit. At the same time, Anne's diary makes poignantly clear the ultimate shining nobility of that spirit. Despite the horror and the humiliation of their daily lives, these people never gave up. Anne herself, and most of all, it is her portrait which emerges so vividly and so appealingly from this book, matured very rapidly in these two years, the crucial years from 13 to 15, in which change is so swift and so difficult for every young girl. Sustained by her warmth and her wit, her intelligence, and the rich resources of her inner life, Anne wrote and thought much of the time about things which very sensitive and talented adolescents, without the threat of death, will write. Her relations with her parents her developing self-awareness, the problems of growing up. These are the thoughts and expression of a young girl living under extraordinary conditions, and for this reason her diary tells us much about ourselves and about our own children. And for this reason, too, I felt how close we all are to Anne's experience, how very much involved we are in her short life and in the entire world, Anne's diary is an appropriate monument to her fine spirit and to the spirits of those who have worked and are working still for peace. Reading it is a rich and rewarding experience. Eleanor Roosevelt And now, Anne Frank, Diary of a Young Girl. I hope I shall be able to confide in you completely, as I have never been able to do in anyone before, and I hope that you will be a great support and comfort to me. Anna Frank, 12 June, 1942. Anna Frank, The Diary of a Young Girl. Sunday, 14 June, 1942. On Friday, June 12th, I woke up at 6 o'clock, and no wonder, it was my birthday. But of course, I was not allowed to get up at that hour, so I had to control my curiosity until a quarter to seven. Then I could bear it no longer and went to the dining room where I received a warm welcome from Murchi, the cat. Soon after seven, I went to Mummy and Daddy and then to the sitting room to undo my presents. The first to greet me was you, possibly the nicest of all, then, on the table, there were a bunch of roses, a plant, and some peonies, and more arrived during the day. I got masses of things from Mummy and Daddy, and was thoroughly spoiled by various friends. Among other things, I was given camera obscura, a party game, lots of sweets, chocolates, a puzzle, a brooch, Tales and Legends of the Netherlands by Joseph Cohen, Daisy's Mountain Holiday, a terrific book, and some money. Now I can buy the myths of Greece and Rome. Grand. 
Then Lees called for me and we went to school. During recess, I treated everyone to sweet biscuits, and then we had to go back to our lessons. Now I must stop. Bye-bye. We're going to be great pals. Monday, 15 June, 1942. I had my birthday party on Sunday afternoon. We showed a film, The Lighthouse Keeper with Rin Tin Tin, which my school friends thoroughly enjoyed. We had a lovely time. There were lots of girls and boys. Mummy always wants to know whom I'm going to marry. Little does she guess that it's Peter Vessel. One day, I managed, without blushing or flickering an eyelid, to get that idea right out of her mind. For years, Lee's Goosens and Sani Hootman have been my best friends. Since then, I've got to know Yopi Duval at the Jewish Secondary School. We are together a lot, and she is now my best girlfriend. Lee's is more friendly with another girl, and Sana goes to a different school, where she has made new friends. Saturday, 20 June 1942. I haven't written for a few days, because I wanted, first of all, to think about my diary. It's an odd idea for someone like me to keep a diary, not only because I have never done so before, but because it seems to me that neither I, nor for that matter anyone else, will be interested in the unbosomings of a thirteen-year-old schoolgirl. Still, what does that matter? I want to write, but more than that, I want to bring out all kinds of things that lie buried deep in my heart. There is a saying that paper is more patient than man. It came back to me on one of my slightly melancholy days, while I sat chin in hand, feeling too bored and limp, even to make up my mind whether to go out or stay at home. Yes, there is no doubt that paper is patient, and as I don't intend to show this cardboard-covered notebook bearing the proud name of diary to anyone, unless I find a real friend, boy or girl, probably nobody cares. And now I come to the root of the matter, the reason for my starting a diary. It is that I have no such real friend. Well, let me put it more clearly, since no one will believe that a girl of thirteen feels herself quite alone in the world. Nor is it so. I have darling parents and a sister of sixteen. I know about thirty people whom one might call friends. I have strings of boyfriends anxious to catch a glimpse of me, and who, failing that, peep at me through mirrors in class. I have relations, aunts and uncles, who are darlings too, a good home. No, I don't seem to lack anything. But it's the same with all my friends, just fun and joking, nothing more. I can never bring myself to talk of anything outside the common round. We don't seem to be able to get any closer. That is the root of the trouble. Perhaps I lack confidence. But anyway, there it is. A stubborn fact, and I don't seem to be able to do anything about it. Hence this diary. In order to enhance in my mind's eye the picture of the friend for whom I have waited so long... I don't want to set down a series of bald facts in a diary like most people do, but I want this diary itself to be my friend. And I shall call my friend Kitty. Well, no one will grasp what I'm talking about if I begin my letters to Kitty just out of the blue, so, albeit unwillingly, I will start by sketching in brief the story of my life. My father was 36 when he married my mother, who was then 25. My sister, Margot, was born in 1926 in Frankfurt on Main. I followed on June 12, 1929, and, as we are Jewish, we immigrated to Holland in 1933, where my father was appointed managing director of Travis N.V. This firm is in close relationship with the firm of Colin & Company in the same building, the of which my of father, family, apart. however, felt the full impact of Hitler's anti-Jewish laws— so life was filled with anxiety. In 1938, after the pogroms, my two uncles, my mother's brothers, escaped to the USA. My old grandmother came to us. She was then 73. After May 1940, good times rapidly fled. First the war, then the capitulation, followed by the arrival of the Germans, which is when the sufferings of us Jews really began. 
anti-Jewish decrees followed each other in quick succession. Jews must wear a yellow star. Footnote. To distinguish them from others, all Jews were forced by the Germans to wear, prominently displayed, a yellow six-pointed star. Jews must hand in their bicycles. Jews are banned from trains and are forbidden to drive. Jews are only allowed to do their shopping between three and five o'clock, and then only in shops which bear the placard, Jewish shop. Jews must be indoors by eight o'clock and cannot even sit in their own gardens after that hour. Jews are forbidden to visit theaters, cinemas, and other places of entertainment. Jews may not take part in public sports. Swimming baths, tennis courts, hockey fields, and other sports grounds are all prohibited to them. Jews may not visit Christians. Jews must go to Jewish schools and many more restrictions of a similar kind. So, we could not do this and were forbidden to do that. But life went on in spite of it all. Yopi used to say to me, You're scared to do anything because it may be forbidden. Our freedom was strictly limited, yet things were still bearable. Granny died in January 1942. No one will ever know how much she is present in my thoughts and how much I love her still. In 1934, I went to school at the Montessori kindergarten and continued there. It was at the end of the school year, I was in Form 6B, when I had to say goodbye to Mrs. K. We both wept. It was very sad. In 1941, I went with my sister Margot to the Jewish secondary school, she into the fourth form and I into the first. So far, everything is all right with the four of us, and here I come to the present day. Saturday, 20 June, 1942. Dear Kitty, I'll start straight away. It is so peaceful at the moment. Mummy and Daddy are out, and Margot has gone to play ping-pong with some friends. I've been playing ping-pong a lot myself lately. We ping-pongers are very partial to an ice cream, especially in summer when one gets warm at the game. So we usually finish up with a visit to the nearest ice cream shop, Delphi or Oasis, where Jews are allowed. We've given up scrounging for extra pocket money, Oasis is usually full, and among our large circle of friends, we always manage to find some kind-hearted gentleman or boyfriend who presents us with more ice cream than we could devour in a week. I expect you will be rather surprised at the fact that I should talk of boyfriends at my age. Alas, one simply can't seem to avoid it at our school. As soon as a boy asks if he may bicycle home with me and we get into conversation— Nine out of ten times, I can be sure that he will fall head over heels in love immediately and simply won't allow me out of his sight. After a while, it cools down, of course, especially as I take little notice of ardent looks and pedal blithely on. If it gets so far that they begin asking father, I swerve slightly on my bicycle, my satchel falls, the young man is bound to get off and hand it to me, by which time I have introduced a new topic of conversation." These are the most innocent types. You get some who blow kisses or try to get hold of your arm, but then they are definitely knocking at the wrong door. I get off my bicycle and refuse to go further in their company, or I pretend to be insulted and tell them in no uncertain terms to clear off. There. The foundation of our friendship is laid. Till tomorrow. Yours, Sunday, Anna. 21 June 1942. Dear Kitty, our whole class B-1 is trembling. The reason is that the teacher's meeting is to be held soon. There is much speculation as to who will move up and who will stay put. Miep de Jong and I are highly amused at Vim and Jacques, the two boys behind us. They won't have a florin left for the holidays. It will all be gone on betting. You'll move up, shan't, shall, from morning till night. Even Miep pleads for silence, and my angry outbursts don't calm them. According to me, a quarter of the class should stay where they are. There are some absolute cuckoos, but teachers are the greatest freaks on earth, so perhaps they will be freakish in the right way for once. I'm not afraid about my girlfriends and myself. We'll squeeze through somehow, though I'm not too certain about my math. Still, we can but wait patiently— Till then, we cheer each other along. 
I get along quite well with all my teachers, nine in all, seven masters and two mistresses. Mr. Keptor, the old math master, was very annoyed with me for a long time because I chatter so much. So I had to write a composition with a chatterbox as the subject. A chatterbox. Whatever could one write? However, deciding I would puzzle that out later, I wrote it in my notebook and tried to keep quiet. That evening, when I'd finished my other homework, my eyes fell on the title in my notebook. I pondered, while chewing the end of my fountain pen, that anyone can scribble some nonsense in large letters with the words well-spaced, but the difficulty was to prove, beyond doubt, the necessity of talking. I thought and thought, and then, suddenly having an idea, filled my three allotted sides and felt completely satisfied. My arguments were that talking is a feminine characteristic, and that I would do my best to keep it under control, but I should never be cured, for my mother talked as much as I, probably more, and what can one do about inherited qualities? Mr. Keptor had to laugh at my arguments, but when I continued to hold forth in the next lesson, another composition followed. This time it was incurable chatterbox. I handed this in, and Kepter made no complaints for two whole lessons. But in the third lesson, it was too much for him again. Anna, as punishment for talking, will do a composition entitled Quack, 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 Says Mrs. Natterbeek. Shouts of laughter from the class. I had to laugh, too, although I felt that my inventiveness on this subject was exhausted. I had to think of something else, something entirely original. I was in luck as my friend Sana writes good poetry and offered to help by doing the whole composition in verse. I jumped for joy. Kepter wanted to make a fool of me with this absurd theme. I would get my own back and make him the laughing stock of the whole class. The poem was finished and was perfect. It was about a mother duck and a father swan who had three baby ducklings. The baby ducklings were bitten to death by father because they chattered too much. Luckily, Keptor saw the joke. He read the poem out loud to the class with comments, and also to various other classes. Since then, I am allowed to talk, never get extra work. In fact, Keptor always jokes about it. Wednesday, Yours, 24 um, June, 1942. Dear Kitty, it is boiling hot. We are all positively melting, and in this heat I have to walk everywhere. Now I can fully appreciate how nice a tram is. But... That is a forbidden luxury for Jews. Shank's mare is good enough for us. I had to visit the dentist in the Jan Lukenstraat in the lunch hour yesterday. It is a long way from our school in the Stad Stimmerthwinen. I nearly fell asleep in school that afternoon. Luckily, the dentist's assistant was very kind and gave me a drink. She's a good sort. We are allowed on the ferry, and that is about all. There is a little boat from the Yosef Israel Skada. The man there took us at once when we asked him. It is not the Dutch people's fault that we are having such a miserable time. I do wish I didn't have to go to school, as my bicycle was stolen in the Easter holidays, and Daddy has given mummies to a Christian family for safekeeping. But, thank goodness, the holidays are nearly here. One more week and the agony is over. Something amusing happened yesterday. I was passing the bicycle sheds, when someone called out to me. I looked around, and there was the nice-looking boy I met on the previous evening at my girlfriend Ava's home. He came shyly towards me and introduced himself as Harry Goldberg. I was rather surprised and wondered what he wanted, but I didn't have to wait long. He asked if I would allow him to accompany me to school. As you're going my way in any case, I will, I replied, and so we went together. Harry is 16 and can tell all kinds of amusing stories. He was waiting for me again this morning, and I expect he will from now on. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 30 June, 1942. Dear Kitty, I have not had a moment to write to you until today. I was with friends all day on Thursday. On Friday we had visitors, and so it went on until today. Harry and I have got to know each other well in a week and he has told me a lot about his life. He came to Holland alone and is living with his grandparents. His parents are in Belgium. Harry had a girlfriend called Fanny, 
I know her, too, a very soft, dull creature. Now that he has met me, he realizes that he was just daydreaming in Fanny's presence. I seem to act as a stimulant to keep him awake. You see, we all have our uses, and queer ones, too, at times. Yopi slept here on Saturday night, but she went to Lee's on Sunday, and I was bored stiff. Harry was to have come in the evening, but he rang up at 6 p.m., I went to the telephone. He said, Harry Goldberg here. Please, may I speak to Anna? Yes, Harry, Anna speaking. Uh, hello, Anna, how are you? Very well, thank you. I'm terribly sorry I can't come this evening, but I would like to just speak to you. Is it all right if I come in ten minutes? Yes, that's fine. Goodbye. Goodbye, I'll be with you soon. I changed into another sock and smartened up my hair a bit. Then I stood nervously at the window, watching for him. At last, I saw him coming. It was a wonder I didn't dash down at once. Instead, I waited patiently until he rang. Then I went down, and he positively burst in when I opened the door. Anna, my grandmother thinks you are too young to go out regularly with me, and that I should go to the lures, but perhaps you know that I am not going out with Fanny any more. No? Why is that? Have you quarreled? No, not at all. I told Fanny that we didn't get on well together, so it was better for us not to go out together any more. But she was always welcome in our home, and I hope I should be in hers. You see, I thought Fanny had been going out with another boy and treated her accordingly, but that was quite untrue. And now my uncle says I should apologize to Fanny. But of course, I didn't want to do that, so I finished the whole affair. That was just one of the many reasons. My grandmother would rather I went with Fanny than you. But I shan't. Old people have such terribly old-fashioned ideas at times. But I just can't fall into line. I need my grandparents, but in a sense they need me too. From now on, I shall be free on Wednesday evenings. Officially, I go to wood-carving lessons to please my grandparents. In actual fact, I go to a meeting of the Zionist movement. I'm not supposed to because my grandparents are very much against the Zionists. I'm by no means a fanatic, but I have a leaning that way and find it interesting. But lately it has become such a mess there that I'm going to quit. So next Wednesday will be my last time. Then I shall be able to see you on Wednesday evenings, Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, and perhaps more. But your grandparents are against it. You can't do it behind their backs. Love finds a way. Then we passed the bookshop on the corner, and there stood Peter Vessel with two other boys. He said hello. It's the first time he has spoken to me for ages. I was really pleased. Harry and I walked on and on, and the end of it all was that I should meet him at five minutes to seven in the front of his house next evening. Yours, Anna. Friday, 3 July 1942. Dear Kitty, Harry visited us yesterday to meet my parents. I had bought a cream cake, sweets, tea, and fancy biscuits, quite a spread. But neither Harry nor I felt like sitting stiffly side by side indefinitely, so we went for a walk, and it was already ten past eight when he brought me home. Daddy was very cross, and thought it was very wrong of me because it is dangerous for Jews to be out after eight o'clock, and I had to promise to be in by ten to eight in future. Tomorrow I've been invited to his house. My girlfriend Yopi teases me the whole time about Harry. I'm honestly not in love. Oh, no, I can surely have boyfriends. No one thinks anything of that. But one boyfriend, or beau as mother calls him, seems to be quite different. Harry went to see Ava one evening, and she told me that she asked him, Who do you like best, Fanny or Anna? He said, It's nothing to do with you. But when he left, they hadn't chatted together any more the whole evening. Now listen, it's Anna. So long and don't tell a soul. And like a flash, she was gone. It's easy to see that Harry is in love with me. Rather fun for a change. Margot would say, Harry is a decent lad. I agree, but he is more than that. Mummy is full of praise. A good-looking boy, a well-behaved, nice boy. I'm glad that the whole family approves of him. He likes them, too, but he thinks my girlfriends are very childish. And he's quite right. 
Sunday Yours, morning, five July, nineteen forty-two. Dear Kitty, our examination results were announced in the Jewish theater last Friday. I couldn't have hoped for better. My report is not at all bad. I had one Vik's satis, a five for algebra, two sixes, and the rest were all sevens or eights. They were certainly pleased at home, although over the question of marks, my parents are quite different from most. They don't care a bit whether my reports are good or bad, as long as I'm well and happy and not too cheeky. Then the rest will come by itself. I am just the opposite. I don't want to be a bad pupil. I should really have stayed in the seventh form in the Montessori school, but was accepted for the Jewish secondary. When all the Jewish children had to go to Jewish schools, the headmaster took Lee's and me conditionally after a bit of persuasion. He relied on us to do our best, and I don't want to let him down. My sister Margot has her report too, brilliant as usual. She would move up with cum laude if that existed at school. She is so brainy. Daddy has been at home a lot lately, as there is nothing for him to do at business. It must be rotten to feel so superfluous. Mister Coupeuis has taken over Travis, and Mister Crawler the firm Colin and Company. When we walked across our little square together a few days ago, Daddy began to talk of us going into hiding. I asked him why on earth he was beginning to talk of that already. Yes, Anna, he said. You know that we have been taking food, clothes, furniture to other people for more than a year now. We don't want our belongings to be seized by the Germans, but we certainly don't want to fall into their clutches ourselves. So we shall disappear of our own accord and not wait until they come and fetch us. But, Daddy, when would it be? He spoke so seriously that I grew very anxious. Don't you worry about it. We shall arrange everything. Make the most of your carefree young life while you can. That was all. Oh, may the fulfillment of these somber words remain far distant yet. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, eight July, nineteen forty-two. Dear Kitty, years seem to have passed between Sunday and now. So much has happened; it is just as if the whole world had turned upside down. But I am still alive, Kitty, and that is the main thing. Daddy says. Yes, I am still alive, indeed, but. Don't ask where or how. You wouldn't understand a word, so I will begin by telling you what happened on Sunday afternoon. At three o'clock, Harry had just gone, but was coming back later. Someone rang the front doorbell. I was lying lazily reading a book on the veranda in the sunshine, so I didn't hear it. A bit later, Margot appeared at the kitchen door, looking very excited. The SS have sent a call-up notice for Daddy. She whispered. Mummy has gone to see Mister Van Don already. Van Don is a friend who works with Daddy in the business. It was a great shock to me, a call up. Everyone knows what that means. I picture concentration camps and lonely cells. Should we allow him to be doomed to this? Of course he won't go," declared Margot while we waited together. Mummy has gone to the Van Dons to discuss whether we should move into our hiding place tomorrow. The Van Dons are going with us, so we shall be seven in all. Silence. We couldn't talk any more, thinking about Daddy, who, little knowing what was going on, was visiting some old people in the Yudzi Invalid, waiting for Mummy. The heat and suspense all made us very suddenly. Over the bell rang silent. again. That is Harry. I said, "Don't open the door." Margot held me back, but it was not necessary, as we heard Mummy and Mister Van Don downstairs talking to Harry. Then they came in and closed the door behind them. Each time the bell went, Margot or I had to creep softly down to see if it was Daddy, not opening the door to anyone else. Margot and I were sent out of the room. Van Don wanted to talk to Mommy alone. When we were alone together in our bedroom, Margot told me that the call-up was not for Daddy, but for her. I was more frightened than ever and began to cry. Margot is sixteen. Would they really take girls of that age away alone? But thank goodness she won't go. Mummy said so herself. That must be what Daddy meant when he talked about us going into hiding. Into hiding, where would we go? In a town or the country? In a house or a cottage? When? How? Where? 
These were questions I was not allowed to ask, but I couldn't get them out of my mind. Margot and I began to pack some of our most vital belongings into a school satchel. The first thing I put in was this diary. Then hair curlers, handkerchiefs, school books, a comb, old letters. I put in the craziest things with the idea that we were going into hiding. But I'm not sorry. Memories mean more to me than dresses. At five o'clock, Daddy finally arrived, and we phoned Mr. Coupuis to ask if he could come around in the evening. Fondon went and fetched Miep. Miep has been in the business with Daddy since 1933 and has become a close friend, likewise her brand new husband, Hank. Miep came and took some shoes, dresses, coats, underwear, and stockings away in her bag, promising to return in the evening. Then silence fell on the house. Not one of us felt like eating anything. It was still hot, and everything was very strange. We let our large upstairs room to a certain Mr. Goodsmith, a divorced man in his thirties, who appeared to have nothing to do on this particular evening. We simply could not get rid of him without being rude. He hung about until ten o'clock. At eleven o'clock, Miep and Hank Van Santen arrived. Once again, shoes, stockings, books, and underclothes disappeared into Miep's bag and Hank's deep pockets, and at eleven-thirty they too disappeared. I was dog-tired, and although I knew that it would be my last night in my own bed, I fell asleep immediately and didn't wake up until Mummy called me at five-thirty the next morning. Luckily, it was not so hot as Sunday. Warm rain fell steadily all day. We put on heaps of clothes as if we were going to the North Pole, the sole reason being to take clothes with us. No Jew in our situation would have dreamed of going out with a suitcase full of clothing. I had on two vests, three pairs of pants, a dress, on top of that a skirt, jacket, summer coat, two pairs of stockings, lace-up shoes, woolly cap, scarf, and still more. I was nearly stifled before we started, but no one inquired about that. Margot filled her satchel with school books, fetched her bicycle, and rode off behind me up into the unknown, as far as I was concerned. You see, I still didn't know where our secret hiding place was to be. At 7.30, the door closed behind us. Murchi, my little cat, was the only creature to whom I said farewell. She would have a good home with the neighbors. This was all written in a letter addressed to Mr. Goodsmith. There was one pound of meat in the kitchen for the cat— Breakfast things lying on the table, stripped beds, all giving the impression that we had left helter-skelter. But we didn't care about impressions. We only wanted to get away, only escape and arrive safely, nothing else. Continued tomorrow. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 9 July, 1942. Dear Kitty, So we walked in the pouring rain, Daddy, Mommy, and I, each with a school satchel and shopping bag filled to the brim with all kinds of things thrown together anyhow. We got sympathetic looks from people on their way to work. You could see by their faces how sorry they were they couldn't offer us a lift. The gaudy yellow star spoke for itself. Only when we were on the road did Mummy and Daddy begin to tell me bits and pieces about the plan. For months, as many of our goods and chattels and necessities of life as possible had been sent away— and they were sufficiently ready for us to have gone into hiding of our own accord on July 16th. The plan had had to be speeded up ten days because of the call-up, so our quarters would not be so well organized, but we had to make the best of it. The hiding place itself would be in the building where Daddy has his office. It will be hard for outsiders to understand, but I shall explain that later on. Daddy didn't have many people working for him, Mr. Crawler, Kupwis, Miep, and Ellie Vosen, a 23-year-old typist, who all knew of our arrival. Mr. Vosen, Ellie's father, and two boys worked in the warehouse. They had not been told. I will describe the building. There is a large warehouse on the ground floor which is used as a store. The front door to the house is next to the warehouse door, and inside the front door is a second doorway which leads to a staircase, A. There is another door at the top of the stairs, with a frosted glass window in it, which has office written in black letters across it. That is the large main office, very big, very light, and very full. Ellie, Miep, and Coupuis work there in the daytime. 
A small dark room containing the safe, a wardrobe, and a large cupboard leads to a small, somewhat dark second office. Mr. Crawler and Mr. Van Don used to sit here. Now it is only Mr. Crawler. One can reach Crawler's office from the passage, but only via a glass door which can be opened from the inside, but not easily from the outside. From Crawler's office, a long passage goes past the coal store, up four steps, and leads to the showroom of the whole building, the private office. Dark, dignified furniture, linoleum and carpets on the floor, radio, smart lamp, everything first class. Next door there is a roomy kitchen with a hot water faucet and a gas stove. Next door, the W.C. That is the first floor. A wooden staircase leads from the downstairs passage to the next floor, B. There is a small landing at the top, and there is a door at each end of the landing, the left one leading to a storeroom at the front of the house and to the attics. One of those really steep Dutch staircases runs from the side to the other door, opening onto the street, C. The right-hand door leads to our secret annex, no one would ever guess that there would be so many rooms hidden behind that plain gray door. There's a little step in front of the door, and then you are inside. There is a steep staircase immediately opposite the entrance, D. On the left, a tiny passage brings you into a room which was to become the Franck family's bed-sitting room. Next door, a smaller room, study, and bedroom for the two young ladies of the family. On the right... A little room without windows containing the wash basin and a small W.C. compartment, with another door leading to Margot's and my room. If you go up the next flight of stairs and open the door, you are simply amazed that there could be such a big light room in such an old house by the canal. There is a gas stove in this room, thanks to the fact that it was used as a laboratory, and a sink. This is now the kitchen for the Van Don couple, besides being general living room, dining room, and scullery. A tiny little corridor room will become Peter Van Don's apartment. Then, just on the lower landing, there is a large attic. So, there you are. I've introduced you to the whole of our beautiful secret annex. Friday, yours, 10 Friday. July, 1942. Dear Kitty, I expect I have thoroughly bored you with my long-winded descriptions of our dwelling, but still I think you should know where we've landed. But, to continue my story, you see I've not finished yet... When we arrived at the Prinzengracht, Miep took us quickly upstairs and into the secret annex. She closed the door behind us, and we were alone. Margot was already waiting for us, having come much faster on her bicycle. Our living room and all the other rooms were chock full of rubbish, indescribably so. All the cardboard boxes which had been sent to the office in the previous months lay piled on the floor and the beds. The little room was filled to the ceiling with bedclothes, we had to start clearing up immediately if we wished to sleep in decent beds that night. Mommy and Margo were not in a fit state to take part. They were tired and lay down on their beds. They were miserable and lots more besides. But the two clearers up of the family, Daddy and myself, wanted to start at once. The whole day long we unpacked boxes, filled cupboards, hammered and tidied, until we were dead beat. We sank into clean beds that night, we hadn't had a bit of anything warm the whole day, but we didn't care. Mummy and Margot were too tired and keyed up to eat, and Daddy and I were too busy. On Tuesday morning, we went on where we left off the day before. Ellie and Miep collected our rations for us. Daddy improved the poor blackout. We scrubbed the kitchen floor and were on the go the whole day long again. I hardly had time to think about the great change in my life until Wednesday. Then I had a chance for the first time since our arrival, to tell you all about it, and at the same time to realize myself what had actually happened to me and what was still going to happen. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 11 July, 1942. Dear Kitty, Daddy, Mummy, and Margot can't get used to the sound of the Vestratorn clock yet, which tells us the time every quarter of an hour. I can. I loved it from the start, and especially in the night, it's like a faithful friend. I expect you'll be interested to hear what it feels like to disappear. Well, all I can say is that I don't know myself yet. I don't think I shall ever really feel at home in this house, but that does not mean that I loathe it here. 
It is more like being on vacation in a very peculiar boarding house. <laughs> Rather a mad idea, perhaps, but that is how it strikes me. The secret annex is an ideal hiding place. Although it leans to one side and is damp, you'd never find such a comfortable hiding place anywhere in Amsterdam. No, perhaps not even in the whole of Holland. Our little room looked very bare at first with nothing on the walls. But thanks to Daddy, who had brought my film star collection and picture postcards on beforehand, and with the aid of paste pot and brush, I have transformed the walls into one gigantic picture. This makes it look much more cheerful, and when the Vandans come, we'll get some wood from the attic and make a few little cupboards for the walls and other odds and Margo ends and to make are a little bit better light. now. Mummy felt well enough to cook some soup for the first time yesterday but then forgot all about it while she was downstairs talking, so the peas were burned to a cinder and utterly refused to leave the pan. Mr. Coop Weiss has brought me a book called Young People's Annual. The four of us went to the private office yesterday evening and turned on the radio. I was so terribly frightened that someone might hear it that I simply begged Daddy to come upstairs with me. Mummy understood how I felt and came too. We are very nervous in other ways, too, that the neighbors might hear us or see something going on. We made curtains straight away on the first day. Really, one can hardly call them curtains. They are just light, loose strips of material, all different shapes, quality, and pattern, which Daddy and I sewed together in a most unprofessional way. These works of art are fixed in position with drawing pins, not to come down until we emerge from here. There are some large business premises on the right of us, and on the left a furniture workshop. There is no one there after working hours, but even so, sounds could travel through the walls. We have forbidden Margot to cough at night, although she has a bad cold, and make her swallow large doses of codeine. I am looking for Tuesday when the Van Dons arrive. It will be much more fun and not so quiet. It is a silence that frightens me so in the evenings and at night— I wish like anything that one of our protectors could sleep here at night. I can't tell you how oppressive it is never to be able to go outdoors. Also, I'm very afraid that we shall be discovered and be shot. That is not exactly a pleasant prospect. We have to whisper and tread lightly during the day. Otherwise, the people in the warehouse might hear us. Someone is calling me. Yours, Anna. Friday, 14 August 1942. Dear Kitty, I have deserted you for a whole month, but honestly, there is so little news here that I can't find amusing things to tell you every day. The Fondons arrived on July 13th. We thought they were coming on the 14th, but between the 13th and 16th of July, the Germans called up people right and left, which created more and more unrest. So they played for safety. Better a day too early than a day too late. At 9.30 in the morning... We were still having breakfast. Pater arrived, the Von Don's son. Not sixteen yet, a rather soft, shy, gawky youth. Can't expect much from his company. He brought his cat, Mushi, with him. Mr. and Mrs. Von Don arrived half an hour later, and to our great amusement, she had a large potty in her hat box. I don't feel at home anywhere without my chamber, she declared. So it was the first thing to find its permanent resting place under her divan. Mr. Von Don did not bring his, but carried a folding tea table under his arm. From the day they arrived, we all had meals cozily together, and after three days it was just as if we were one large family. Naturally, the Von Dons were able to tell us a lot about the extra week they had spent in the inhabited world. Among other things, we were very interested to hear what had happened to our house and to Mr. Goodsmith. Mr. Goodsmith Mr. At nine o'clock on Monday morning and asked if I could come around. I went immediately and found G. in a state of great agitation. He let me read a letter that the Francs had left behind, and wanted to take the cat to the neighbors as indicated in the letter, which pleased me. Mr. G. was afraid that the house would be searched, so we went through all the rooms, tidied up a bit, and cleared away the breakfast things. Suddenly, I discovered a writing pad on Mrs. Franck's desk, with an address in Maastricht written on it, Although I knew this was done on purpose, I pretended to be very surprised and shocked, and urged Mr. G. to tear off this unfortunate little piece of paper without delay. 
I went on pretending that I knew nothing of your disappearance all the time, but after seeing the paper, I got a brain wave. Mr. Goodsmith, I said, it suddenly dawns on me what this address may refer to. Now it all comes back to me. A high-ranking officer was in the office about six months ago. He appeared to be very friendly with Mr. Franck and offered to help him should the need arise. He was stationed in Maastricht. I think he must have kept his word and somehow or other managed to get them into Belgium and then on to Switzerland. I should tell this to any friends who may inquire. Don't, of course, mention Maastricht. With these words I left the house. Most of your friends know already because I've been told myself several times by different people. We were highly amused at the story, and when Mr. Von Don gave us further details, laughed still more at the way people can let their imaginations run away with them. One family had seen the pair of us pass on bicycles very early in the morning, and another lady knew quite definitely that we were fetched by a military car in the middle of the night. Yours, Anna. Friday, 21 August, 1942. Dear Kitty, the entrance to our hiding place has now been properly concealed. Mr. Crawler thought it would be better to put a cupboard in front our door, because a lot of houses are being searched for hidden bicycles. But of course it had to be a movable cupboard that can open like a door. Mr. Vosen made the whole thing. We had already let him into the secret, and he can't do enough to help. If we want to go downstairs, we have to first bend down and then jump, because the step is gone. The first three days we were all going about with masses of lumps on our foreheads because we all knocked ourselves against the low doorway. Now we have nailed a cloth filled with wood wool against the top of the door. Let's see if that helps. I'm not working much at present. I'm giving myself holidays until September. Then Daddy is going to give me lessons. It's shocking how much I've forgotten already. There is little change in our life here. Mr. Von Don and I usually manage to upset each other. It's just the opposite with Margot, whom he likes very much. Mummy sometimes treats me just like a baby, which I can't bear. Otherwise, things are going better. I still don't like Pater anymore. He is so boring. He flops lazily on his bed half the time, does a bit of carpentry, and then goes back for another snooze. What a fool. It is lovely weather. And in spite of everything, we make the most we can of it by lying on a camp bed in the attic, where the sun shines through an open window. Wednesday, yours, 2 Anna. September, 1942. Dear Kitty, Mr. and Mrs. Von Don have had a terrific quarrel. I've never seen anything quite like it before. Mummy and Daddy would never dream of shouting at each other. The cause was so trivial that the whole thing was a pure waste of breath. But still, everyone to his own liking... Naturally, it is very unpleasant for Pater, who has to stand by. No one takes him seriously. He is so frightfully touchy and lazy. Yesterday, he was badly upset because he found that his tongue was blue instead of red. This unusual phenomenon of nature disappeared just as quickly as it had come. Today, he is going about with a scarf on, as he has a stiff neck. In addition, my lord complains of lumbago. Pains around the heart, kidneys, and lungs are not unusual either. He is a real hypochondria. That's the word for such people, isn't it? It is not all honey between Mummy and Mrs. Von Don. There is plenty of cause for unpleasantness. To give a small example, I will tell you that Mrs. Von Don has taken all three of her sheets out of the common linen cupboard. She takes it for granted that Mummy sheets will do for all of us. It will be a nasty surprise for her when she finds that Mummy has followed her good example. Also, she is thoroughly piqued that her dinner service and not ours is in use. She is always trying to find out where we have actually put our plates. They are closer than she thinks. They are in a cardboard box behind a lot of junk in the attic. Our plates are ungetable as long as we are here, and a good thing, too. I always have bad luck. I smashed one of Mrs. Von Don's soup plates into a thousand pieces yesterday. Oh, she cried angrily. Couldn't you be more careful for once? That's the last one I've got. Mr. Von Don is all sugar to me nowadays. Long may it last. Mummy gave me another frightful sermon this morning. I can't bear them. Our ideas are completely opposite. Daddy is a darling, although he can sometimes be angry with me for five minutes on end. 
Last week, we had a little interruption in our monotonous life. It was over a book about women and Pater. First, I must tell you that Margot and Pater are allowed to read nearly all the books that Mr. Coupuis lends us. But the grown-ups held back this particular book on the subject of women. Pater's curiosity was aroused at once. What was it the two of them were not allowed to read in this book? He got hold of the book on the sly while his mother was downstairs talking and disappeared with his booty to the attic. All went well for a few days. His mother knew what he was doing but didn't tell tales until father found out. He was very angry, took the book away, and thought that that would finish the whole business. However, he had not allowed for his son's curiosity, which waxed rather than waned because of his father's attitude. Pater, determined to finish it, thought of a way to get hold of this enthralling book. In the meantime, Mrs. Von Don had asked Mummy what she thought about it all. Mummy thought this particular book was not suitable for Margot, but she saw no There's harm in letting There's a great difference, Mrs. Von Don, said Mummy, between Margot and Pater. In the first place, Margot is a girl, and girls are always more grown up than boys. Secondly, Margot has read quite a lot of serious books and does not go in search of things that are forbidden her. And thirdly, Margot is far more developed and intelligent, shown by the fact of her being in the fourth form at school. Mrs. Von Don agreed, but still thought it was wrong in principle to let children read books which were written for grown-ups. In the meantime, Pater had found a time of the day when no one bothered about him or the book, 7.30 in the evening. Then everyone was in the private office listening to the radio. That was when he took his treasure to the attic again. He should have been downstairs again by 8.30, but because the book was so thrilling he forgot the time and was just coming downstairs as his father came into the room. You can imagine the consequences. With a slap and a snatch, the book lay on the table and Pater was in the attic. That's how matters stood as we sat down to table. Pater stayed upstairs, no one bothered about him, and he had to go to bed without any supper. We went on with the meal, chattering gaily, when suddenly we heard a piercing whistle. We all stopped eating and looked with pale, changed faces from one to another. Then we heard Pater's voice calling down the chimney. I say I'm not coming down anyway. Mr. Von Don sprang to his feet. His napkin fell to the floor and scarlet in the face he shouted, I've had enough of this. Daddy took his arm, afraid of what might happen, and the two men went together to the attic. After a good deal of resistance and stamping, Pater landed up in his room with the door closed and we went on eating. Mrs. Von Don wanted to save one slice of bread for the dear boy, but his father stood firm. If he doesn't apologize soon, he will have to sleep in the attic. Loud protests from the rest of us, as we thought missing supper was quite enough punishment. Besides, Pater might catch cold and we couldn't call a doctor. Pater did not apologize. He was already in the attic. Mr. Von Don did nothing more about it, but I noticed the next morning that Pater's bed had been slept in. Pater was back in the attic at seven o'clock, but Daddy managed with a few friendly words to persuade him to come down again. Sour faces and obstinate silences for three days, and then everything went smoothly once more. Monday, your 21 on. September 1942. Dear Kitty, today I'm going to tell you our general news. Mrs. Von Don is unbearable. I get nothing but blow-ups from her for my continuous chatter. She is always pestering us in some way or other. This is the latest. She doesn't want to wash up the pans if there is a fragment left. Instead of putting it into a glass dish, as we've always done until now, she leaves it in the pan to go bad. After the next meal, Margot sometimes has about seven pans to wash up. And then Madame says, Well, well, Margot, you have got a lot to do. I'm busy with Daddy working out his family tree. As we go along, he tells me little bits about everyone. It's terribly interesting. Mr. Coupuis brings a few special books for me every other week. I'm thrilled with the Hupe de Hule series. I've enjoyed the whole of Sissy Van Marksveld very much, and I've read In Zomer's Old Tide four times, and I still laugh about some of the ludicrous situations that arise. Term time has begun again. I'm working hard at my French and manage to pump in five irregular verbs per day. Pater sighs and groans over his English. A few school books have just arrived. We have a good stock of exercise books, pencils, rubbers, and labels, as I brought these with me. 
I sometimes listen to the Dutch news from London. Heard Prince Bernard recently. He said that Princess Juliana is expecting a baby about next January. I think it is lovely. It surprises the others that I should be so keen on the royal family. I was being discussed, and they decided that I'm not completely stupid after all, which had the effect of making me work extra hard the next day. I certainly don't want to still be in the first form when I'm 14 or 15. Also, the fact that I'm hardly allowed to read any decent books was mentioned. Mummy is reading Heron, Ralvin, and Connicton now, which I'm not allowed. Margot is. First, I must be more developed like my talented sister. Then we talk about my ignorance of philosophy and psychology, about which I know nothing. Perhaps by next year I shall be wiser. I looked up these difficult words quickly in Cunin. I have just woken up to the disturbing fact that I have one long-sleeved dress and three cardigans for the winter. I've received permission from Daddy to knit a jumper of white sheep's wool. It is not very nice wool, but as long as it's warm, that's all that matters. We have some clothes deposited with friends, but unfortunately we shall not see them until after the war. That is, if they are still there, then. I had just written something about Mrs. Von Don when she came in. Slap. I closed the book. Hey, Anna, can't I just have a look? I'm afraid not. Just the last page, then. No, I'm sorry. Naturally, it gave me a frightful shock, because there was an unflattering description of her on this particular page. Friday, 25 Yours, September, Anna. 1942. Dear Kitty, Yesterday evening I went upstairs and visited the Fondans. I do so occasionally to have a chat. Sometimes it can be quite fun. Then we have some moth biscuits. The biscuit tin is kept in the wardrobe, which is full of mothballs, and drink lemonade. We talked about Pater. I told them how Pater often strokes my cheek and that I wished he wouldn't as I don't like being pawed by boys. In a typical way parents have, they asked if I couldn't get fond of Pater because he certainly liked me very much. I thought, oh dear, and said, oh no, imagine it. I did say that I thought Pater rather awkward, but that it was probably shyness, as many boys who haven't had much to do with girls are like that. I must say that the refuge committee of the secret annex, mail section, is very ingenious. I'll tell you what they've done now to get news of us through to Mr. Van Dyke, Travis' chief representative, and a friend who has surreptitiously hidden some of our things for us. They typed a letter to a chemist in South Zealand, who does business with our firm, in such a way that he has to send the enclosed reply back in an addressed envelope. Daddy addressed the envelope to the office. When this envelope arrives from Zealand, the enclosed letter is taken out and is replaced by a message in Daddy's handwriting as a sign of life. Like this, Van Dyke won't become suspicious when he reads the note. They specially chose Zealand because it is so close to Belgium, and the letter could have easily been smuggled over the border. In addition, no one is allowed into Zealand without a special permit. So, if they thought we were there, he couldn't try and look us up. Yours, Anna. Sunday, 27 September, 1942. Dear Kitty, just had a big bust up with Mummy for the upteenth time. We simply don't get on together these days, and Margot and I don't hit it off any too well either. As a rule, we don't go in for such outbursts as this in our family. Still, it's by no means always pleasant for me. Margot's and Mummy's natures are completely strange to me. I can understand my friends better than my own mother. Too bad. We often discuss post-war problems. For example, how one ought to address servants. Mrs. Von Don had another tantrum. She is terribly moody. She keeps hiding more of her private belongings. Mummy ought to answer each Von Don disappearance with a Franck disappearance. How some people do adore bringing up other people's children in addition to their own. The Von Dons are that kind. Margot doesn't need it. She is such a goody-goody, perfection itself. But I seem to have enough mischief in me for the two of us put together. You should hear us at mealtimes, with reprimands and cheeky answers flying to and fro. Mummy and Daddy always defend me stoutly. I'll have to give up if it weren't for them. Although they do tell me that I mustn't talk so much, that I must be more retiring and not poke my nose into everything... Still, I seem doomed to failure. 
If Daddy wasn't so patient, I'd be afraid I was going to turn out to be a terrific disappointment to my parents. And if they are I take a small helping of some vegetable I detest and make up with potatoes. The Van Dons and Mevrauf in particular can't get over it that any child should be so spoiled. Come along, Anna, have a few more vegetables, she says straight away. No, thank you, Mrs. Van Don, I answer. I have plenty of potatoes. Vegetables are good for you. Your mother says so, too. Have a few more, she says, pressing them on me until Daddy comes to my rescue. Then we have from Mrs. Van Don. You ought to have been in our home. We were properly brought up. It's absurd that Anna's so frightfully spoiled. I wouldn't put up with it if Anna were my daughter. These are always her first and last words. If Anna were my daughter, thank heavens I'm not. But to come back to this upbringing business... There was a deadly silence after Mrs. Von Don had finished speaking yesterday. Then Daddy said, I think Anna is extremely well brought up. She has learned one thing anyway, and that is to make no reply to your long sermons. As to vegetables, look at your own plate. Mrs. Von Don was beaten, well and truly beaten. She had taken a minute helping of vegetables herself, but she is not spoiled. Oh, no. Too many vegetables in the evening make her constipated. Why on earth doesn't she keep her mouth shut about me? Then she wouldn't need to make such feeble excuses. <laughs> it's gorgeous the way Mrs. Von Don blushes. I don't, and that is just what she hates. Yours, Anna. Monday, 28 September 1942. Dear Kitty, I had to stop yesterday, long before I'd finished. I just must tell you about another quarrel, but before I start on that, something else. Why do grown-ups quarrel so easily, so much, and over the most idiotic things? Up till now, I thought that only children squabbled, and that that wore off as you grew up. Of course, there is sometimes a real reason for a quarrel, but this is just plain bickering— I suppose I should get used to it, but I can't, nor do I think I shall as long as I am the subject of nearly every discussion. They use the word discussion instead of quarrel. Nothing, I repeat, nothing about me is right. My general appearance, my character, my manners are discussed from A to Z. I'm expected, by order, to simply swallow all the harsh words and shouts in silence, and I am not used to this. In fact, I can't. I'm not going to take all these insults lying down. I'll show them that Anna Frank wasn't born yesterday. Then they'll be surprised, and perhaps they'll keep their mouths shut when I let them see that I'm going to start educating them. Shall I take up that attitude? Plain barbarism. I'm simply amazed again and again over their awful manners and especially stupidity, Mrs. Von Don's. But as soon as I get used to this, and it won't be long, then I'll give them some of their own back, and no half measures. Then they'll change their tune. Am I really so bad-mannered, conceited, headstrong, pushing, stupid, lazy, etc., etc., as they all say? Oh, of course not. I have my faults, just like everyone else, I know that. But they thoroughly exaggerate everything. Kitty, if you only knew how I sometimes boil under so many jibes and jeers... And I don't know how long I shall be able to stifle my rage. I shall just blow up one day. Still, no more of this. I've bored you long enough with all these quarrels. But I simply must tell you of one highly interesting other, discussion. We got on to the subject of Pim's, Daddy's nickname, extreme modesty. Even the most stupid people have to admit this about Daddy. Suddenly, Mrs. Von Don says, I, too, have an unassuming nature, more so than my husband. Did you ever? This sentence in itself shows quite clearly how thoroughly forward and pushing she is. Mr. Von Don thought he ought to give an explanation regarding the reference to himself. I don't wish to be modest. In my experience, it does not pay. Then to me, take my advice, Anna. Don't be too unassuming. It doesn't get you anywhere. Mummy agreed with this, too. But Mrs. Von Don had to add, as always, her ideas on the subject— her next remark was addressed to Mummy and Daddy. You have a strange outlook on life. Fancy saying such a thing to Anna. It was very different when I was young, and I feel sure that it still is, except in your modern home. This was a direct hit at the way Mummy brings up her daughters. Mrs. Van Don was scarlet by this time. Mummy, 
calm and cool as a cucumber. People who blush get so hot and excited, it is quite a handicap in such a situation. Mummy, still entirely unruffled, but anxious to close the conversation as soon as possible, thought for a second, and then said, I find, too, Mrs. Van Don, that one gets on better in life if one is not over-modest. My husband now, and Margot and Pater are exceptionally modest, whereas your husband, Anna, you and I, though not exactly the opposite, don't allow ourselves to be completely pushed to one side. Mrs. Van Don, but, Mrs. Frank, I don't understand you. I'm so very modest and retiring. How can you think of calling me anything else? Mummy, I did not say you were exactly forward, but no one could say you had a retiring disposition. Mrs. Van Don, let us get this matter cleared up once and for all. I'd like to know in what way I am pushing. I know one thing. If I didn't look after myself, I'd soon be starving. This absurd remark in self-defense just made Mummy rock with laughter. That irritated Mrs. Van Don, who added a string of German-Dutch-Dutch-German expressions until she became completely tongue-tied. Then she rose from her chair and was about to leave the room. Suddenly her eye fell on me. You should have seen her. Unfortunately, at the very moment that she turned round, I was shaking my head sorrowfully, not on purpose, but quite involuntarily, for I had been following the whole conversation so closely. Mrs. Van Don turned round and began to reel off a lot of harsh German, common and ill-mannered, just like a coarse, red-faced fishwife. It was a marvelous sight. If I could draw, I'd have liked to catch her like this. It was a scream, such a stupid, foolish little person. Anyhow, I've learned one thing now. You only really get to know people when you've had a jolly good row with them. Then, and then only, can you judge their true characters. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 29 September 1942. Dear Kitty, Extraordinary things can happen to people who go into hiding. Just imagine, as there is no bath, we use a wash tub. And because there is hot water in the office, by which I always mean the whole of the lower floor... All seven of us take it in turns to make use of this great luxury. But because we are all so different, and some are more modest than others, each member of the family has found his own place for carrying out the performance. Pater uses the kitchen in spite of its glass door. When he is going to have a bath, he goes to each one of us in turn and tells us that we must not walk past the kitchen for half an hour. He seems to think this is sufficient. Mr. Von Don goes right upstairs. To him it is worth the bother of carrying hot water all the way, so as to have the seclusion of his own room. Mrs. Von Don simply doesn't bathe at all at present. She is waiting to see which is the best place. Daddy has his bath in the private office, Mummy behind a fire guard in the kitchen, Margot and I have chosen the front office for our scrub. The curtains there are drawn on Saturday afternoon, so we wash ourselves in semi-darkness. However, I don't like this place any longer, and since last week I've been on the lookout for more comfortable quarters. Pater gave me an idea, and that was to try the large office W.C. There I can sit down, have the light on, lock the door, pour my own bath water away, and I'm safe from prying eyes. I tried my beautiful bathroom on Sunday for the first time, and although it sounds mad, I think it's the week, best place of all. The plumber was at work downstairs to move the drains and water pipes from the office WC to the passage. This change is a precaution against frozen pipes, in case we should have a cold winter. The plumber's visit was far from pleasant for us. Not only were we unable to draw water the whole day, but we could not go to the WC either. Now it is rather indecent to tell you what we did to overcome this difficulty... However, I'm not such a prude that I can't talk about these things. The day we arrived here, Daddy and I improvised a potty for ourselves. Not having a better receptacle, we sacrificed a glass preserving jar for this purpose. During the plumber's visit, nature's offerings were deposited in these jars in the sitting room during the day. I don't think this was nearly as bad as having to sit still and not talk the whole day. You can't imagine what a trial that was for Miss Quack Quack. I have to whisper on ordinary days but not being able to speak or move was ten times worse. After being flattened by three days of continuous sitting, my bottom was very stiff and painful. Some exercises at bedtime helped. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 1 October 1942. Dear Kitty, 
I got a terrible shock yesterday. Suddenly, at eight o'clock, the bell rang loudly. Of course, I thought that someone had come. You'll guess who I mean. But I calmed down a bit when everyone said it must be some urchins or perhaps the postman. The days are becoming very quiet here. Levin, a small Jewish chemist and dispenser, works for Mr. Crawler in the kitchen. He knows the whole building well, and therefore we are always afraid that he'll take it into his head to have a peep in the old laboratory. We are as quiet as mice. Who, three months ago, would ever have guessed that Quicksilver Anna would have to sit still for hours? And what's more, could. The twenty-ninth was Mrs. Von Don's birthday. Although it could not be celebrated in a big way, we managed a little party in her honor, with a specially nice meal, and she received some small presents and flowers. Red carnations from her husband. That seems to be a family tradition. To pause for a moment on the subject of Mrs. Von Don, I must tell you that her attempts to flirt with Daddy are a source of continual irritation for me. She strokes his face and hair, pulls her skirt right up, and makes so-called witty remarks, trying in this way to attract Pym's attention. Pym, thank goodness, doesn't find her either attractive or funny, so he doesn't play ball. Mummy doesn't behave like that with Mr. Von Don. I've said that to Mrs. Von Don's face. Now and then, Pater comes out of his shell and can be quite funny. We have one thing in common, from which everyone usually gets a lot of amusement— we both love dressing up. He appeared in one of Mrs. Von Don's very narrow dresses, and I put on his suit. He wore a hat and I a cap. The grown-ups were doubled up with laughter, and we enjoyed ourselves as much as they did. Ellie has bought new skirts for Margot and me at Biencorf's. The material is rotten, just like sacking, and they cost twenty-four florins and seven and a half florins, respectively. What a difference compared with before the war! Another nice thing I've been keeping up my sleeve. Ellie has written to some secretarial school or other and ordered a correspondence course in shorthand for Margot Pater and me. You wait and see what perfect experts we shall be by next year. In any case, it's extremely important to be able to write in a code. Yours, Anna. Anne Frank. This ends The Diary of a Young one. Girl. Disc 2. Saturday, 3 October, 1942. Dear Kitty, there was another dust-up yesterday. Mummy kicked up a frightful row and told Daddy just what she thought of me. Then she had an awful fit of tears, so of course off I went too. And I'd got such an awful headache anyway. Finally, I told Daddy that I'm much more fond of him than Mummy, to which he replied that I'd get over that. But I don't believe it. I have to simply force myself to stay calm with her. Daddy wishes that I would sometimes volunteer to help Mummy when she doesn't feel well or has a headache, but I shan't. I am working hard at my French and am now reading La Belle Nivernaise. Yours, Anna. Friday, 9 October 1942. Dear Kitty, I've only got dismal and depressing news for you today. Our many Jewish friends are being taken away by the dozen— these people are treated by the Gestapo without a shred of decency, being loaded into cattle trucks and sent to Vesterbork, the big Jewish camp in Drenthe. Vesterbork sounds terrible. Only one washing cubicle for a hundred people, and not nearly enough lavatories. There is no separate accommodations. Men, women, children all sleep together. One hears of frightful immorality because of this, and a lot of the women, and even girls who stay there any length of time— are expecting babies. It is impossible to escape. Most of the people in the camp are branded as inmates by their shaven heads, and many also by their Jewish appearance. If it is as bad as this in Holland, whatever will it be like in the distant and barbarous regions they are sent to? We assume that most of them are murdered. The English radio speaks of their being gassed. Perhaps that is the quickest way to die. I feel terribly upset— I couldn't tear myself away when Miep told these dreadful stories, and she herself was equally wound up for that matter. Just recently, for instance, a poor old crippled Jewess was sitting on her doorstep. She had been told to wait there by the Gestapo, who had gone to fetch a car to take her away. The poor old thing was terrified by the guns that were shooting at English planes overhead and by the glaring beams of the searchlights. 
But Miep did not dare take her in. No one would undergo such a risk. The Germans strike without the slightest mercy. Ellie, too, is very quiet. Her boyfriend has got to go to Germany. She is afraid that the airmen who fly over her home will drop their bombs, often weighing a million kilos on Dirk's head. Jokes such as, he's not likely to get a million and it only takes one bomb, are in rather bad taste. And Dirk is certainly not the only one who has to go. Trainloads of boys leave daily. If they stop at a small station en route, sometimes some of them manage to get out unnoticed and escape. Perhaps a few manage it. This, however, is not the end of my bad news. Have you ever heard of hostages? That's the latest thing in penalties for sabotage. Can you imagine anything so dreadful? Prominent citizens, innocent people, are thrown into prison to await their fate. If the saboteur can't be traced, the Gestapo simply puts about five hostages against the wall. Announcements of their deaths appear in the papers frequently. These outrages are described as fatal accidents. Nice people, the Germans. To think that I was once one of them, too. No, Hitler took away our nationality long ago. In fact, Germans and Jews are the greatest enemies in the world. Friday, 16 Yours October 1942. Dear Kitty, I'm terribly busy. I've just translated a chapter out of La Belle Nivernaise and made notes of new words. Then a perfectly foul math problem and three pages of French grammar... I flatly refuse to do these math problems every day. Daddy agrees that they're vile. I'm almost better at them than he is, though neither of us are much good and we often have to fetch Margot. I'm the furthest on of the three of us in shorthand. Yesterday, I finished The Assault. It's quite amusing, but doesn't touch Yupp de Hill. As a matter of fact, I think Sissy Van Marksveld is a first-rate writer. I shall definitely let my children read her books. Mummy, Margot, and I are as thick as thieves again. It's really much better. Margot and I got in the same bed together last evening. It was a frightful squash, but that was just the fun of it. She asked if she could read my diary. I said, yes, at least bits of it. Then, then I asked if I could read hers, and she said yes. Then we got on to the subject of the future. I asked her what she wanted to be, but she wouldn't say and made a great secret of it. I gathered something about teaching. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I think so. <laughs> really, I shouldn't be so curious. This morning, I was lying on Pater's bed, having chased him off at first. He was furious with me, not that I cared very much. He might be a bit more friendly with me for once. After all, I did give him an apple yesterday. I asked Margot if she thought I was very ugly. She said that I was quite attractive and that I had nice eyes. Rather vague, don't you think? Till next time. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 20 October 1942. Dear Kitty, My hand still shakes, although it's two hours since we had the shock. I should explain that there are five fire extinguishers in the house. We knew that someone was coming to fill them, but no one had warned us when the carpenter, or whatever you call him, was coming. The result was that we weren't making any attempt to keep quiet— until I heard hammering outside on the landing opposite our cupboard door. I thought of the carpenter at once and warned Ellie, who was having a meal with us, that she shouldn't go downstairs. Daddy and I posted ourselves at the door so as to hear when the man left. After he'd been working for a quarter of an hour, he laid his hammer and tools down on top of our cupboard, as we thought, and knocked at our door. We turned absolutely white— Perhaps he had heard something after all and wanted to investigate our secret den. It seemed like that. The knocking, pulling, pushing, and wrenching went on. I nearly fainted at the thought that this utter stranger might discover our beautiful secret hiding place. And just as I thought my last hour was at hand, I heard Mr. Coupoui say, Open the door, it's only me. We opened it immediately. The hook that holds the cupboard, which can be undone by people who know the secret, had got jammed. That was why no one had been able to warn us about the carpenter. The man had now gone downstairs, and Coupuis wanted to fetch jelly, but couldn't open the cupboard again. In my imagination, the man who I thought was trying to get in had been growing and growing in size, until in the end he appeared to be a giant, and the greatest fascist that ever walked the earth. Well, well, luckily everything was okay this time. 
Meanwhile, we had great fun on Monday. Miep and Hank spent the night here. Margo and I went in Mummy and Daddy's room for the night, so that the Von Santums could have our room. The meal tasted divine. There was one small interruption. Daddy's lamp blew a fuse, and all of a sudden we were sitting in darkness. What was to be done? There was some fuse wire in the house, but the fuse box is right at the very back of the dark storeroom. Not such a nice job after dark. Still, the men ventured forth, and after ten minutes, we were able to put the candles away again. I got up early this morning. Hank had to leave at half past eight. After a cozy breakfast, Miep went downstairs. It was pouring, and she was glad not to have to cycle to the office. Next week, Ellie is coming to stay for a night. Thursday, 29 October 1942. Dear Kitty, I am awfully worried. Daddy is ill. He has a high temperature and a red rash. It looks like measles. Think of it. We can't even call a doctor. Mummy is letting him have a good sweat. Perhaps that will send his temperature down. This morning, Miep told us that all the furniture has been removed from the Von Don's home. We haven't told Mrs. Von Don yet. She's such a bundle of nerves already, and we don't feel like listening to another moan over all the lovely china and beautiful chairs that she left at home. We had to leave almost all our nice things behind, so what's the good of grumbling about it now? I'm allowed to read more grown-up books lately. I'm now reading Ava's Youth by Nico van Suchtelen. I can't see much difference between this and the schoolgirl love stories. It is true that there are bits about women selling themselves to unknown men in back streets. They ask a packet of money for it. I'd die of shame if anything like that happened to me. Also, it says that Ava has a monthly period. Oh, I'm so longing to have it, too. It seems so important. Daddy has brought the plays of Goethe and Schiller from the big cupboard. He's going to read to me every evening. We've started with Don Carlos. Following Daddy's good example, Mummy has pressed her prayer book into my hand. For decency's sake, I read some of the prayers in German. They are certainly beautiful, but they don't convey much to me. Why does she force me to be pious just to oblige her? Tomorrow, we are going to light the fire for the first time. I expect we shall be suffocated with smoke. The chimney hasn't been swept for ages. Let's hope the thing draws. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 7 November, 1942. Dear Kitty, Mummy is frightfully irritable, and that always seems to herald unpleasantness for me. Is it just a chance that Daddy and Mummy never rebuke Margot, and that they always drop on me for everything? Yesterday evening, for instance, Margot was reading a book with lovely drawings in it. She got up and went upstairs, put the book down ready to go on with it later. I wasn't doing anything so picked up the book and started looking at the pictures. Margot came back, saw her book in my hands, wrinkled her forehead, and asked for the book back. Just because I wanted to look a little further on, Margot got more and more angry. Then Mummy joined in. Give the book to Margot. She was reading it, she said. Daddy came into the room. He didn't even know what it was all about, but saw the injured look on Margot's face and promptly dropped on me. I'd like to see what you'd say if Margot ever started looking at one of your books. I gave way at once, laid the book down, and left the room, offended as they thought. It so happened I was neither offended nor cross, just miserable. It wasn't right of Daddy to judge without knowing what the squabble was about. I would have given Margot the book myself, and much more quickly, if Mummy and Daddy hadn't interfered. They took Margot's part at once— as though it's she were the victim of some great stick up for Margot. She and Margot always do back each other up. I'm so used to that that I'm utterly indifferent to both Mummy's jawing and Margot's moods. I love them, but only because they are Mummy and Margot. With Daddy, it's different. If he holds Margot up as an example, approves of what she does, praises and caresses her, then something gnaws at me inside, because I adore Daddy. He is the one I look up to. I don't love anyone in the world but him. He doesn't notice that he treats Margot differently from me. Now, Margot is just the prettiest, sweetest, most beautiful girl in the world. But all the same, I feel I have some right to be taken seriously, too. I've always been the dunce, the ne'er-do-well of the family. I've always had to pay double for my deeds, 
first with the scolding, and then again because of the way my feelings are hurt. Now, I'm not satisfied with this apparent favoritism any more. I want something from Daddy that he is not able to give me. I'm not jealous of Margot, never have been. I don't envy her good looks or her beauty. It is only that I long for Daddy's real love, not only as his child, but for me, Anna. I cling to Daddy because it is only through him that I am able to retain the remnant of family feeling. Daddy doesn't understand that I need to give vent to my feelings over Mummy sometimes. He doesn't want to talk about it. He simply avoids anything which might lead to remarks about Mummy's failings. Just the same, Mummy and her failings are something I find harder to bear than anything else. I don't know how to keep it all to myself. I can't always be drawing attention to her untidiness, her sarcasm, and her lack of sweetness. Neither can I believe that I'm always in the wrong. We are exact opposites in everything, so naturally we are bound to run up against each other. I don't pronounce judgment on Mummy's character, for that is something I can't judge. I only look at her as a mother, and she just doesn't succeed in being that to me. I have to be my own mother. I've drawn myself apart from them all. I am my own skipper, and later on I shall see where I come to land. All this comes about particularly because I have in my mind's eye an image of what a perfect mother and wife should be, and in her whom I must call mother I find no trace of that image. I am always making resolutions not to notice Mummy's bad example. I want to see only the good side of her and to seek in myself what I cannot find in her. But it doesn't work, and the worst of it is neither Daddy nor Mummy understands this gap in my life, and I blame them for it. I wonder if anyone can ever succeed in making their children absolutely content. Sometimes I believe that God wants to try me, both now and later on. I must become good through my own efforts, without examples and without good advice, then later on I shall be all the stronger. Who besides me will ever read these letters? From whom but myself shall I get comfort? As I need comforting often, I frequently feel weak and dissatisfied with myself. My shortcomings are too great. I know this, and every day I try to improve myself My treatment again varies again. so much. One day Anna is so sensible and is allowed to know everything— and the next day I hear that Anna is just a silly little goat who doesn't know anything at all and imagines that she's learned a wonderful lot from books. I'm not a baby or a spoiled darling any more to be laughed at, whatever she does. I have my own views, plans, and ideas, though I can't put them into words yet. Oh, so many things bubble up inside me as I lie in bed, having to put up with people I'm fed up with who always misinterpret my intentions— that's why, in the end, I always come back to my diary. That is where I start and finish, because Kitty is always patient. I'll promise her that I shall persevere in spite of everything and find my own way through it all and swallow my tears. I only wish I could see the results already or occasionally receive encouragement from someone who loves me. Don't condemn me. Remember, rather, that Sometimes I, too, can reach the bursting point. Yours, Anna. Monday, 9 November, 1942. Dear Kitty, Yesterday was Pater's birthday. He was 16. He had some nice presents. Among other things, a game of Monopoly, a razor, and a lighter. Not that he smokes much, it's really just for show. The biggest surprise came from Mr. Fondon when at one o'clock he announced that the British had landed in Tunis, Algiers, Casablanca, and Oran. This is the beginning of the end, everyone was saying. But Churchill, the British Prime Minister, who had probably heard the same thing in England, said, This is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Do you see the difference? There is certainly reason for optimism— Stalingrad, the Russian town which they've already been defending for three months, still hasn't fallen into German hands. But to return to affairs in our secret den, I must tell you something about our food supply. As you know, we have some real greedy pigs on the top floor. We get our bread from a nice baker, a friend of Coupuis, 
We don't get so much as we used to at home, naturally, but it's sufficient. Four ration cards have also been bought illegally. Their price is going up all the time. It has now gone up from twenty-seven florins to thirty-three. And all that for a little slip of printed paper. In order to have something in the house that will keep, apart from our one hundred and fifty tins of vegetables, we have bought two hundred and seventy pounds of dried peas and beans. They are not all for us, some are for the office people. They are in sacks which hang on hooks in our little passage, inside the hidden door. Owing to the weight of the contents, a few stitches in the sacks burst open, so we decided it would be better to put our winter store in the attic, and Pater was given the job of dragging it all up there. He had managed to get five of the six sacks upstairs, intact, and he was just busy pulling up number six, when the bottom seam of the sack split, and a shower, no, a positive hailstorm of brown beans came pouring down and rattled down the stairs. There were about fifty pounds in the sack, and the noise was enough to waken the dead. Downstairs they thought the old house with all its contents was coming down on them. Thank God there were no strangers in the house. It gave Pater a moment's fright, but he was soon roaring with laughter, especially when he saw me standing at the bottom of the stairs like a little island in the middle of a sea of beans. I was entirely surrounded up to my ankles in beans. Quickly we started to pick them up, but... Beans are so slippery and small that they seem to roll into all the possible and impossible corners and holes. Now, every time anyone goes downstairs, they bend down once or twice in order to be able to present Mrs. Von Don with a handful of beans. Oh, I'd almost forgotten to mention that Daddy is quite better again. Yours, Anna. P.S. The news has just come over the radio that Algiers has fallen. Morocco, Casablanca, and Oran have been in British hands for several days. Now we're waiting Tuesday, for Tunis. Tuesday, 10 November 1942. Dear Kitty, great news. We want to take in an eighth person. Yes, really. We've always thought that there was quite enough room and food for one more. We were only afraid of giving Coupuis and Crawler more trouble. But now that the appalling stories we hear about Jews are getting even worse, Daddy got hold of the two people who had to decide— and they thought it was an excellent plan. It is just as dangerous for seven as for eight, they said, and quite rightly. When this was settled, we ran through our circle of friends, trying to think of a single person who would fit in well with our family. It wasn't difficult to hit on someone. After Daddy had refused all members of the Von Don family, we chose a dentist called Albert Dussel, whose wife was fortunate enough to be out of the country when war broke out. He is known to be quiet, and, so far as we and Mr. Von Don can judge from a superficial acquaintance, both families think he is a congenial person. Miep knows him, too, so she will be able to make arrangements for him to join us. If he comes, he will have to sleep in my room instead of Margot, who will use the camp bed. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 12 November, 1942. Dear Kitty... Dussel was awfully pleased when Miep told him that she had got a hiding place for him. She urged him to come as soon as possible, preferably Saturday. He thought that this was rather doubtful, since he had to bring his card index up to date first, see to a couple of patients, and settle his accounts. Miep came to us with this news this morning. We thought it was unwise of him to put it off. All these preparations entail explanations to a number of people, whom we would rather keep out of it. Miep is going to ask if he can't manage to come on Saturday after all. Dussel said no. Now he is coming on Monday. I must say I think it's pretty crazy that he doesn't jump at the proposal, whatever it is. If he were to get picked up outside, would he still be able to do his card index, settle his finances, and see to his patients? Why delay, then? I think it's stupid of Daddy to have given in. No other news. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 17 November, 1942. Dear Kitty, Dussel has arrived. All went well. Miep had told him that he must be at a special place in front of the post office at 11 o'clock, where a man would meet him. Dussel was standing at the rendezvous dead on time. Mr. Coupuis, who knows Dussel too, went up to him and told him that the said gentleman could not come, but asked whether he would just go to Miep at the office. Coupuis got onto a tram and went back to the office while Dussel walked in the same direction. At twenty past eleven, 
Dussel tapped at the office door. Miep helped him off with his coat so that the yellow star would not be seen, and took him to the private office, where Coupuis engaged him in conversation until the charwoman had gone. Then, Miep went upstairs with Dussel, under the pretext that the private office was needed for something, opened the swinging cupboard, and stepped inside before the eyes of the dumbfounded sat around the table Dussel. upstairs, waiting with coffee and cognac to greet the newcomer. Miep showed him into our sitting room first. He recognized our furniture at once, and had not the remotest idea that we were there above his head. When Miep told him, he nearly passed out with surprise. But luckily, Miep didn't give him time and took him straight upstairs. Dussel sank into a chair, speechless, and looked at us all for a while as if he had to really take it all in first. After a while, he stuttered. But, Aber, send you not in Belgium, then? Is der Militar nicht come? Das Otto? The escape is seen nicht successful? We explained everything to him that we had spread the story about the soldiers in the car on purpose to put people, and especially the Germans, on the wrong track, should they try to find us. Dusa was again struck dumb by such ingenuity, and when he had explored further our super-practical, exquisite little secret annex, he could do nothing but gaze about him in astonishment. We all had lunch together. Then he had a little nap and joined us for tea, tidied up his things a bit. Miep had brought them beforehand— and began to feel more at home, especially when he received the following typed Secret Annex Rules, Van Don product. Prospectus and Guide to the Secret Annex Special Institution as Temporary Residence for Jews and such like. Open all the year round, beautiful, quiet, free from woodland surroundings in the heart of Amsterdam, can be reached by trams 13 and 17, also by car or bicycle, in special cases also on foot, if the Germans prevent the use of transport. Board and lodging, free. Special fat-free diet. Running water in the bathroom, alas, no bath, and down various inside and outside walls. Ample storage room for all types of goods. Own radio center. Direct communication with London, New York, Tel Aviv, and numerous other stations, this appliance is only for residence use after six o'clock in the evening. No stations are forbidden, on the understanding that German stations are only listened to in special cases, such as classical music and the like. Rest hours. Ten o'clock in the evening until 7.30 in the morning. 10.15 on Sundays. Residents may rest during the day, conditions permitting, as the directors indicate. For reasons of public security, rest hours must be strictly observed. Holidays, outside the home, postponed indefinitely. Use of language. Speak softly at all times by order. All civilized languages are permitted, therefore no German. Lessons. One written shorthand lesson per week. English, French, mathematics, and history at all times. Small pets. Special department. Permit is necessary. Good treatment available. Vermin accepted. Meal times. Breakfast every day except Sunday and bank holidays, 9 a.m. Sundays and bank holidays, 11.30 a.m., approximately. Lunch. Not very big. 1.15 p.m. to 1.45 p.m. Dinner. Cold and or hot. No fixed time, depending on the news broadcast. Duties. Residents must always be ready to help with office work. Baths. The wash tub is available for all residents from 9 a.m. on Sundays. The W.C., kitchen, private office, or main office, whichever preferred, are available. Alcoholic beverages. Only with doctor's prescription. End. Thursday, yours, 19 Anna. November, 1942. Dear Kitty, Dussel is a very nice man, just as we had all imagined. Of course, he thought it was all right to share my little room. Quite honestly, I'm not so keen that a stranger should use my things. But one must be prepared to make some sacrifices for a good cause, so I shall make my little offering with a good will. If we can save someone, then everything else is of secondary importance, says Daddy. And he's absolutely right. The first day that Dussel was here, he immediately asked me all sorts of questions. 
When does the charwoman come? When can one use the bathroom? When is one allowed to use the laboratory? You may laugh, but these things are not so simple in a hiding place. During the day, we mustn't make any noise that might be heard downstairs. And if there is some stranger, such as a charwoman, for example, then we have to be extra careful. I explained all this carefully to Dussel. But one thing amazed me. He is very slow on the uptake. He asks everything twice over and still doesn't seem to remember. Perhaps that will wear off in time, and it's only that he's thoroughly upset by the sudden change. Apart from that, all goes well. Dussel has told us a lot about the outside world, which we have missed for so long now. He had very sad news. Countless friends and acquaintances have gone to a terrible fate. Evening after evening, the green and gray army lorries trundle past. The Germans ring at every door to inquire if there are any Jews living in the house. If there are, then the whole family has to go at once. If they don't find any, they go on to the next house. No one has a chance of evading them unless one goes into hiding. Often they go around with lists and only ring when they know they can get a good haul. Sometimes they let them off for cash, so much per head. It seems like the slave hunts of olden times, but it's certainly no joke. It's much too tragic for that. In the evenings when it's dark, I often see rows of good, innocent people, accompanied by crying children, walking on and on in charge of a couple of these chaps, bullied and knocked about until they almost drop. No one is spared. Old people, babies, expectant mothers, the sick, each and all join in the march of death. How fortunate we are here, so well cared for and undisturbed. We wouldn't have to worry about all this misery were it not that we are so anxious about all those dear to us whom we can no longer help. I feel wicked sleeping in a warm bed, while my dearest friends have been knocked down or have fallen into a gutter somewhere, out in a cold night. I get frightened when I think of close friends who have now been delivered into the hands of the cruelest brutes that walk the earth, and all because they are Jews. Friday, 20 November, 1942. Dear Kitty, none of us really knows how to take it all. The news about the Jews had not really penetrated through to us until now, and we thought it best to remain as cheerful as possible. Every now and then, when Miep lets out something about what has happened to a friend, Mummy and Mrs. Von Don always begin to cry, so Miep thinks it better not to tell us any more. But Dusa was immediately plied with questions from all sides, and the stories he told us were so gruesome and dreadful that one can't get them out of one's mind. Yet we shall have our jokes and tease each other when these horrors have faded a bit in our minds. It won't do us any good or help those outside to go on being as gloomy as we are at the moment. And what would be the object of making our secret annex into a secret annex of gloom? Must I keep thinking about those other people, whatever I am doing? And if I want to laugh about something, should I stop myself quickly and feel ashamed that I am cheerful? Ought I then to cry the whole day long? No, that I can't do. Besides, in time this gloom will wear off. Added to this misery, there is another, but of a purely personal kind, and it pales into insignificance besides all the wretchedness I've just told you about. Still, I can't refrain from telling you that lately I have begun to feel deserted. I am surrounded by too great a void. I never used to feel like this. My fun and amusements and my girlfriends completely filled my thoughts. Now I either think about unhappy things or about myself, and at long last I have made the discovery that Daddy, although he's such a darling, still cannot take the place of my entire little world of bygone days— but why do I bother you with such foolish things? I'm very ungrateful, Kitty, I know that. But it often makes my head swim if I'm jumped upon too much, and then on top of that have to think about all those other miseries. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 28 November, 1942. Dear Kitty, we have used too much electricity, more than our ration. Result, the utmost economy and the prospect of having it cut off. No light for a fortnight. A pleasant thought, that. But who knows? Perhaps it won't happen after all. 
It's too dark to read in the afternoons after four or half past. We pass the time in all sorts of crazy ways, asking riddles, physical training in the dark, talking English and French, criticizing books. But it all begins to pall in the end. Yesterday evening, I discovered something new. To peer through a powerful pair of field glasses into the lighted rooms of the houses at the back. In the daytime, we can't allow even as much as a centimeter's chink to appear between our curtains, but it can't do any harm after dark. I never knew before that neighbors could be such interesting people. At any rate, ours are. I found one couple having a meal. One family was in the act of taking a home movie. And the dentist opposite was just attending to an old lady who was it awfully It was always scared. said about Mr. Dussel that he could get on wonderfully with children and that he loved them all. Now he shows himself in his true colors. A stodgy, old-fashioned disciplinarian and preacher of long, drawn-out sermons on manners. As I have unusual good fortune to share my bedroom, alas, a small one, with his lordship, and as I'm generally considered to be the most badly behaved of the three young people, I have a lot to put up with and have to pretend to be deaf in order to escape the old, much-repeated tickings off and warnings. All this wouldn't be too bad if he wasn't such a frightful sneak and he didn't pick on Mummy of all people to sneak to every time. When I've already just had a dose from him, Mummy goes over it all again, so I get a gale aft as well as four. Then, if I'm really lucky, I'm called on to give an account of myself to Mrs. Von Don, and then I get a veritable hurricane. Honestly, you needn't think it's easy to be the badly brought-up, central figure of a hypercritical family in hiding. When I lie in bed at night and think over the many sins and shortcomings attributed to me, I get so confused by it all that I either laugh or cry. It depends what sort of mood I am in. Then I fall asleep with the stupid feeling of wishing to be different from what I am, or from what I want to be, perhaps to behave differently from the way I want to behave or do behave. Oh, heavens above, now I'm getting you in a muddle, too. Forgive me, but I don't like crossing things out, and in these days of paper shortage we are not allowed to throw paper away. Therefore, I can only advise you not to read the last sentence again— and certainly not to try to understand it, because you won't succeed anyhow. Yours, Anna. Monday, 7 December 1942. Dear Kitty, Hanukkah and St. Nicholas Day came almost together this year, just one day's difference. We didn't make much fuss about Hanukkah. We just gave each other a few little presents, and then we had the candles. Because of the shortage of candles, we only had them alight for ten minutes— but it is all right as long as you have the song. Mr. Von Don has made a wooden candlestick, so that too was all properly arranged. Saturday, the evening of St. Nicholas Day, was much more fun. Miep and Ellie had made us very inquisitive by whispering all the time with Daddy, so naturally we guessed that something was on. And so it was. At eight o'clock we all filed down the wooden staircase, through the passage in pitch darkness, it made me shudder and wish that I was safely upstairs again, into the little dark room. There, as there are no windows, we were able to turn on a light. When that was done, Daddy opened the big cupboard. Oh, how lovely, we all cried. A large basket decorated with St. Nicholas paper stood in the corner, and on top there was a mask of black Peter. We quickly took the basket upstairs with us, there was a nice little present for everyone, with a suitable poem attached. I got a doll, whose skirt is a bag for odds and ends. Daddy got bookends, and so on. In any case, it was a nice idea. And as none of us had ever celebrated St. Nicholas, it was a good way of starting. Thursday, yours, 10 Anna. December, 1942. Dear Kitty, Mr. Von Don used to be in the meat, sausage, and spice business— it was because of his knowledge of this trade that he was taken on in Daddy's business. Now he is showing the sausagey side of himself, which for us is by no means disagreeable. We had ordered a lot of meat, under the counter, of course, for preserving in case we should come upon hard times. It was fun to watch. First the way the pieces of meat went through the mincer, two or three times, then how all the accompanying ingredients were mixed with the minced meat— and then how the intestine was filled by means of a spout to make the sausages. 
We fried the sausage meat and ate it with sauerkraut for supper that evening. But the Gelderland sausages had to be thoroughly dried first, so we hung them over a stick tied to the ceiling with string. Everyone who came into the room began to laugh when they caught a glimpse of the row of sausages on show. They looked terribly funny. The room was in a glorious mess. Mr. Von Don was wearing one of his wife's aprons, swathed around his substantial person. He looked fatter than he is. And was busy with the meat. Hands smothered in blood, red face, and the soiled apron made him look like a butcher. Mrs. Von Don was trying to do everything at once— learning Dutch from a book, stirring the soup, watching the meat being done, sighing and complaining about her injured rib. That's what happens to elderly ladies who do such idiotic exercises to reduce their large behinds. Dussel had inflammation in one eye and was bathing it in chamomile tea by the fire. Pim, who was sitting on a chair in a beam of sunlight that shone through the window, kept being pushed from one side to the other. In addition, I think his rheumatism was bothering him, because he sat rather hunched up with a miserable look on his face, watching Mr. Von Don at work. He looked exactly like some shriveled-up old man from an old people's home. Pater was doing acrobatics around the room with his cat. Mummy, Margot, and I were peeling potatoes. And, of course, all of us were doing everything wrong because we were so busy watching Mr. Von Don. Dussel has opened his dental practice. For the fun of it, I must tell you about his first patient— Mummy was ironing, and Mrs. Von Don was the first to face the ordeal. She went and sat on a chair in the middle of the room. Dussel began to unpack his case in an awfully important way, asked for some eau de cologne as a disinfectant and Vaseline to take the place of wax. He looked in Mrs. Von Don's mouth and found two teeth which, when touched, just made her crumple up as if she was going to pass out, uttering incoherent cries of pain. After a lengthy examination, in Mrs. Von Don's case, lasting in actual fact not more than two minutes, Dussel began to scrape away at one of the holes. But no fear, it was out of the question. The patient flung her arms and legs about wildly in all directions, until at one point Dussel let go of the scraper. That remained stuck in Mrs. Von Don's tooth. Then the fat was really in the fire— She cried, as far as it was possible with such an instrument in one's mouth, tried to pull the thing out of her mouth, and only succeeded in pushing it further in. Mr. Dussel stood with his hands against his sides, calmly watching the little comedy. The rest of the audience lost all control and roared with laughter. It was rotten of us, because I, for one, am quite sure that I should have screamed even louder. After much turning, kicking, screaming, and calling out, she got the instrument free at last— and Mr. Dussel went on with his work as if nothing had happened. This he did so quickly that Mrs. Von Don didn't have time to start any fresh tricks, but he had never had so much help in all his life before. Two assistants are pretty useful. Von Don and I performed our duties well. The whole scene looked like a picture from the Middle Ages entitled A Quack at Work. In the meantime, however, the patient hadn't much patience— She had to keep an eye on her soup and her meal. One thing is certain, Mrs. Von Don won't be in such a hurry to allow herself to be treated again. Sunday, yours, 13 December, 1942. Dear Kitty, I'm sitting cozily in the main office, looking outside through a slit in the curtain. It is dusk, but still just light enough to write to you. It is a very queer sight as I watch the people walking by. It looks just as if they are all in a terrible hurry and nearly trip over their own toes. With cyclists now, one simply can't keep pace with their speed. I can't even see what sort of person is riding on the machine. The people in this neighborhood don't look very attractive. The children especially are so dirty you wouldn't want to touch them with a barge pole. Real slum kids with running noses. I can hardly understand a word they say. Yesterday afternoon... Margot and I were having a bath here, and I said, "'Supposing we were to take the children who are walking past, one by one, "'hoist them up with a fishing rod, give them each a bath, "'wash and mend their clothes, and then let them go again, then—' "'Margot interrupted me. "'By tomorrow they will look just as filthy and ragged as before. "'But I'm just talking nonsense. "'Besides, there are other things to see—cars, boats, and rain— I like particularly the screech of the trams as they go by. There is no more variety in our thoughts than there is for ourselves. 
They go round and round like a roundabout, from Jews to food and from food to politics. By the way, talking of Jews, I saw two Jews through the curtain yesterday. I could hardly believe my eyes. It was a horrible feeling, just as if I had betrayed them and was now watching them in their misery. There is a houseboat immediately opposite, where a bargeman lives with his family. He has a small yapping dog. We only know the little dog by his bark and his tail, which we can see when he runs around the deck. Ugh. Now it started to rain, and most of the people are hidden under umbrellas. I see nothing but raincoats and occasionally the back of someone's hat. Really, I don't need to see more. I'm gradually getting to know all the women at a glance, blown out with potatoes, wearing a red or a green coat, trodden down heels, and with a bag under their arms. Their faces either look grim or kind, depending on their husband's dispositions. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 22 December, 1942. Dear Kitty, the secret annex has heard the joyful news that each person will receive an extra quarter of a pound of butter for Christmas. It says half a pound in the newspapers, but that's only for the lucky mortals who get their ration books from the government, not for Jews who have gone into hiding, who can only afford to buy four illegal ration books instead of eight. We are all going to bake something with our butter. I made some biscuits and two cakes this morning. Everyone is very busy upstairs, and Mummy has told me I must not go there to work or read until Mrs. the household John is in bed done. with her bruised rib, complains the whole day long, allows herself to be given fresh dressings all the time, and isn't satisfied with anything. I shall be glad when she's on her feet again, and tidies up her own things, because I must say this for her, she's exceptionally industrious and tidy, all the while she is healthy in mind and body. She is cheerful, too. Just as if I didn't hear enough shh, shh during the day for making too much noise, my gentleman bedroom companion now repeatedly calls out shh, shh to me at night, too. According to him, I am not even allowed to turn over. I refuse to take the slightest notice of him and shall go shh, shh back at him the next time. He makes me furious, on Sundays especially, when he turns the lights on early to do his exercises. It seems to take simply hours, while I, poor tormented creature, feel the chairs which are placed at the head of my bed to lengthen it, slide backwards and forwards continually under my sleepy head. When he has ended with a couple of violent arm-waving exercises to loosen his muscles, his lordship begins his toilet. His pants are hanging up, so to and fro he must go to collect them. But he forgets his tie, which is lying on the table— Therefore, once more he pushes and bumps the chairs to get it. But I won't bore you any longer on the subject of old men. It won't make things any better, and all my plans of revenge, such as disconnecting the lamp, shutting the door, hiding his clothes, must be abandoned in order to keep the peace. Oh, I'm becoming so sensible. One must apply one's reason to everything here. Learning to obey, to hold your tongue, to help, to be good— to give in, and I don't know what else. I'm afraid I shall use up all my brains too quickly, and I haven't got so very many. Then I shall not have any left for when the war is over. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 13 January, 1943. Dear Kitty, Everything has upset me again this morning, so I wasn't able to finish a single thing properly. It is terrible outside. Day and night, more of those poor, miserable people are being dragged off, with nothing but a rucksack and a little money. On the way, they are deprived even of these possessions. Families are torn apart, the men, women, and children all being separated. Children coming home from school find that their parents have disappeared. Women returning from shopping to find their homes shut up and their families gone. The Dutch people are anxious, too. Their sons are being sent to Germany. Everyone is afraid. And every night, hundreds of planes fly over Holland and go to German towns, where the earth is so plowed up by their bombs. And every hour, hundreds and thousands of people are killed in Russia and Africa. No one is able to keep out of it. The whole globe is waging war. And although it is going better for the Allies, the and end is not us, yet in sight. We are fortunate. Yes, we are luckier than millions of people. It is quiet and safe here, and we are so to speak, living on capital. 
We are even so selfish as to talk about after the war, brighten up at the thought of having new clothes and new shoes, whereas we really ought to save every penny to help other people and save what is left from the wreckage after the war. The children here run about in just a thin blouse and clogs, no coat, no hat, no stockings, and no one helps them. Their tummies are empty. They chew an old carrot to stay the pangs, go from their cold homes out into the cold street, and when they get to school, find themselves in an even colder classroom. Yes, it has got even so bad in Holland that countless children stop the passers-by and beg for a piece of bread. Hyde could go on for hours about all the suffering the war has brought, but then I would only make myself more dejected. There is nothing we can do but wait as calmly as we can till the misery comes to an end. Jews and Christians wait. The whole earth waits. And there are many who wait for death. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 30 January, 1943. Dear Kitty, I'm boiling with rage, and yet I mustn't show it. I'd like to stamp my feet, scream, give Mummy a good shaking, cry, and I don't know what else, because of the horrible words, mocking looks, and accusations which are leveled at me repeatedly every day, and find their mark like shafts from a tightly strung bow, and which are just as hard to draw from my body. I would like to shout to Margot, Von Don, Dussel, and Daddy too, Leave me in peace. Let me sleep one night at least without my pillow being wet with tears, my eyes burning and my head throbbing. Let me get away from it all, preferably away from the world. But I can't do that. They mustn't know my despair. I couldn't bear their sympathy and their kind-hearted jokes. It would only make me want to scream all the more. If I talk, everyone thinks I'm showing off. When I'm silent, they think I'm ridiculous. Rude if I answer. Sly if I get a good idea. Lazy if I'm tired. Selfish if I eat a mouthful more than I should. Stupid, cowardly, crafty, etc., etc. The whole day long I hear nothing else but that I am an insufferable baby. And although I do laugh about it and pretend not to take any notice, I do mind. I would like to ask God to give me a different nature so that I didn't put everyone's back up. But that can't be done. I've got the nature that has been given to me, and I'm sure it can't be bad. I do my very best to please everybody— far more than they'd ever guess. I try to laugh it all off because I don't want to let them see my trouble. More than once, after a whole string of undeserved rebukes, I have flared up at Mummy. I don't care what you say anyhow. Leave me alone. I'm a hopeless case anyway. Naturally, I was then told I was rude and was virtually ignored for two days. And then, all at once, it was quite forgotten, and I was treated like everyone else again. It is impossible for me to be all sugar one day and spit venom the next. I'd rather choose the golden mean, which is not so golden, keep my thoughts to myself, and try for once to be just as disdainful to them as they are to me. Oh, if only I could. Friday, yours, 5 February, 1943. Dear Kitty, although I haven't written anything about our rows for a long time, there still isn't any change. The discord, long accepted by us, struck Mr. Dussel as a calamity at first. But he is getting used to it now, and tries not to think about it. Margot and Pater aren't a bit what you would call young. They are both staid and quiet. I show up terribly against them, and am always hearing, You don't find Margot and Pater doing that. Why don't you follow their example? I simply loathe it. I might tell you I don't want to be in the least like Margot. She is much too soft and passive for my liking, and allows everyone to talk her around and gives in about everything. I want to be a stronger character. But I keep such ideas to myself. They would only laugh at me if I came along with this as an explanation of my attitude. The atmosphere at table is usually strained, though luckily the outbursts are sometimes checked by the soup-eaters— the soup eaters are the people from the office who come in and are served with a cup of soup. This afternoon, Mr. Von Don was talking about Margot eating so little again. I suppose you do it to keep slim, he added, teasing her. Mummy, who always defends Margot, said loudly, 
I can't bear your stupid chatter any longer. Mr. Van Don turned scarlet, looked straight in front of him, and said nothing. We often laugh about things. Just recently, Mrs. Van Don came out with some perfect nonsense. She was recalling the past, how well she and her father got on together, and what a flirt she was. And do you know, she went on, if a man gets a bit aggressive, my father used to say, then you must say to him, Mr. So-and-so, remember, I am a lady, and he will know what you mean. We thought that was a good joke and burst out laughing. Pater, too, although usually so quiet, sometimes gives cause for mirth. He is blessed with a passion for foreign words, although he does not always know their meaning. One afternoon, we couldn't go to the lavatory because there were visitors in the office. However, Pater had to pay an urgent call, so he didn't pull the plug. He put a notice upon the lavatory door to warn us with SVP gas on it. Of course, he meant to put beware of gas, but he thought the other looked more genteel. He hadn't got the faintest notion it meant, if you please. Saturday, Yours, Anna. 27 February, 1943. Dear Kitty, Pym is expecting the invasion any day. Churchill has had pneumonia, but is improving slowly. The freedom-loving Gandhi of India is holding his umpteenth fast. Mrs. Von Don claims to be fatalistic, but who is the most scared when the guns go off? No one else but Petronella. Hank brought a copy of the bishop's letter to churchgoers for us to read. It was very fine and inspiring. Do not rest, people of the Netherlands. Everyone is fighting with his own weapons to free the country, the people, and their religion. Give help. Be generous and do not dismay, is what they cry from the pulpit, just like that. Will it help? It won't help the people of our religion. You'd never guess what has happened to us now. The owner of these premises has sold the house without informing Crawler or Coupuis. One morning the new owner arrived with an architect to have a look at the house. Luckily, Mr. Coupuis was present and showed the gentleman everything except the secret annex. He professed to have forgotten the key of the communicating door. The new owner didn't question any further. It will be all right as long as he doesn't come back and want to see the secret annex, because then it won't look too good for us. Daddy has emptied a card index box for Margot and me and put cards in it. It is to be a book card system. Then we both write down which books we have read, who they are by, etc. I have procured another little notebook for foreign words. Lately, Mummy and I have been getting on better together, but we still never confide in each other. Margot is more catty than ever, and Daddy has got something he is keeping to himself, but he remains the same darling. New butter and margarine rationing at table. Each person has their little bit of fat put on their plate. In my opinion, the Von Dons don't divide it at all fairly. However, my parents are much too afraid of a row to say anything about it. Pity. I think you should always give people like them tit for tat. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 10 March, 1943. Dear Kitty, we had a short circuit last evening, and on top of that the guns kept banging away all the time. I still haven't got over my fear of everything connected with shooting and planes, and I creep into Daddy's bed nearly every night for comfort. I know it's very childish, but you don't know what it is like. The A.A. guns roar so loudly that you can't hear yourself speak. Mrs. Von Don, the fatalist, was nearly crying and said in a very timid little voice, Oh, it is so unpleasant. They are shooting so hard. By which she really means, I'm so frightened. It didn't seem nearly so bad by candlelight as in the dark. I was shivering just as if I had a temperature and begged Daddy to light the candle again. He was relentless. The light remained off. Suddenly there was a burst of machine-gun fire, and that is ten times worse than guns. Mummy jumped out of bed, and to Pim's annoyance lit the candle. When he complained, her answer was firm. After all, Anna's not exactly a veteran Have soldier, told you and that was the end of Don's other fears? I don't think so. If I am to keep you informed of all that happens in the secret annex, you must know about this, too. One night, Mrs. Von Don thought she heard burglars in the attic— she heard loud footsteps and was so frightened that she woke her husband. Just at that moment, the burglars disappeared, 
and the only sounds that Mr. Von Don could hear were the heartbeats of the frightened fatalist herself. Oh, putty, Mr. Von Don's nickname. They are sure to have taken the sausages and all our peas and beans. And, Pater, I wonder if he's still safely in bed. They certainly won't have stolen Pater. Listen, don't worry and let me go to sleep. But nothing came of that. A few nights after that, the whole Von Don family was woken by ghostly sounds. Pater went up to the attic with a torch and... Scamper, scamper, what do you think it was running away? A swarm of enormous rats. When we knew who the thieves were, we let Mushi sleep in the attic, and the uninvited guests didn't come back again, at least not during the night. Pater went up to the loft a couple of evenings ago to fetch some old newspapers. He had to hold the trap door firmly to get down the steps. He put his hand down without looking and went tumbling down the ladder from the sudden shock and pain. Without knowing it, he had put his hand on a large rat, and it had bitten him hard. By the time he reached us, as white as a sheet and with his knees knocking, the blood had soaked through his pajamas. And no wonder, it's not very pleasant to stroke a large rat, and to get bitten into the bargain is really dreadful. Yours, Anna. Friday, 12 March, 1943. Dear Kitty, may I introduce someone to you? Mama Frank. Champion of youth. Extra butter for the young. The problems of modern youth. Mummy defends youth in everything. And after a certain amount of squabbling, she always gets her way. A bottle of preserved soul has gone bad. Gala dinner for Mushi and Bosch. Oh, you haven't met Bosch yet, although she was here before we went into hiding. She is the warehouse and office cat and keeps down the rats in the storerooms. Her odd political name requires an explanation. For some time, the firm had two cats, one for the warehouse and one for the attic. Now, it occasionally happened that the two cats met, and the result was always a terrific fight. The aggressor was always the warehouse cat, yet it was always the attic cat who managed to win, just like among nations. So the storehouse cat was named the German, or Bosch, and the attic cat, the English, or Tommy. Tommy was got rid of later. We are all entertained by Bosch when we, we go downstairs. We have eaten so many kidney beans and haricot beans that I can't bear the sight of them anymore. The mere thought of them makes me feel quite sick. Bread is no longer served in the evenings now. Daddy has just said that he doesn't feel in a good mood. His eyes look so sad again. Poor soul. I can't drag myself away from a book called The Knock at the Door by Ina boudier Bakker. The story of the family is exceptionally well written. Apart from that, it is about war, writers, the emancipation of women, and quite honestly, I'm not awfully interested. Horrible air raids on Germany. Mr. Von Don is in a bad mood. The cause? Cigarette shortage. Discussions over the question of whether we should or should not use our canned vegetables ended in our favor. I can't get into a single pair of shoes anymore except ski boots, which are not much use about the house. A pair of rush sandals costing six and a half florins lasted me just one week, after which they were out of action. Perhaps Miep will scrounge something under the counter. I must cut Daddy's hair. Pim maintains that he will never have another barber after the war, as I do the job so well. If only I didn't snip his ear so often. Yours, Anna. Thursday. 18 March, 1943. Dear Kitty, Turkey is in the war. Great excitement. Waiting in suspense for the news. Yours, Anna. Friday, 19 March, 1943. Dear Kitty, An hour later, joy was followed by disappointment. Turkey is not in the war yet. It was only a cabinet minister talking about them soon giving up their neutrality. A newspaper in the Dom was crying, Turkey on England's side. Footnote. The Dom is a square in front of the royal palace. The newspapers were torn out of his hands. This is how the joyful news reached us, too. Five hundred and thousand guilder notes have been declared no longer valid. It is a trap for black marketeers and such like, but even for people who have got other kinds of black money and for people in hiding. If you wish to hand in a thousand guilder note, you must be able to declare and prove exactly how you got it. 
They may still be used to pay taxes, but only until next week. Dussel has received an old-fashioned foot-operated dentist drill. I expect he'll soon give me a thorough check-over. The Fuhrer Ale Germanen has been talking to wounded soldiers. Listening in to it was pitiful. Question and answer went something like this. My name is Heinrich Scheppel. Wounded where? Near Stalingrad. What kind of wound? Two feet frozen off and a broken joint in the left arm. This is exactly what the frightful puppet show on the radio was like. The wounded seemed to be proud of their wounds. The more, the better. One of them felt so moved at being able to shake hands with the Fuhrer, that is, if he still had a hand, that he could hardly get the words out of his mouth. Thursday, 25 March, 1943. Dear Kitty, Yesterday, Mummy, Daddy, Margot, and I were sitting pleasantly together when suddenly Pater came in and whispered something in Daddy's ear. I heard something about a barrel fallen over in the warehouse and someone fumbling about at the door. Margot had heard it too, but when Daddy and Pater went off immediately, she tried to calm me down a bit because I was naturally as white as a sheet and very jittery. The three of us waited in suspense. A minute or two later, Mrs. Von Don came upstairs. She'd been listening to the wireless in the private office. She told us that Pym had asked her to turn off the wireless and go softly upstairs. But you know what it's like. If you want to be extra quiet, then each step of the old stairs creaks twice as loudly. Five minutes later, Pym and Pater appeared again, white to the roots of their hair, and told us their experience. They had hidden themselves under the stairs and waited, with no result at first. But suddenly, yes, I must tell you, they heard two loud bumps, just as if two doors were banged here in the house. Pym was upstairs in one leap. Peter warned Jusel first, who finally landed upstairs with a lot of fuss and noise. Then we all went up in stockinged feet to the Von Dons on the next floor. Mr. Von Don had a bad cold and had already gone to bed, so we all drew up closely around his bed and whispered our suspicions to him. Each time Mr. Von Don coughed loudly, Mrs. Von Don and I were so scared that we thought we were going to have a fit. That went on until one of us got the bright idea of giving him some codeine, which soothed the cough at once. Again we waited and waited, but we heard no more, and finally we all came to the conclusion that the thieves had taken to their heels when they heard footsteps in the house, which was otherwise so silent. Now it was unfortunate that the wireless downstairs was still tuned to England, and that the chairs were neatly arranged around it. If the door had been forced, and the air raid wardens had noticed and warned the police, then the results might have been very unpleasant. So Mr. Von Don got up and put on his coat and hat, and followed Daddy cautiously downstairs. Pater took up the rear, armed with a large hammer in case of emergencies. The ladies upstairs, including Margot and me, waited in suspense, until the gentleman reappeared five minutes later and told us that all was quiet in the house. We arranged that we would not draw any water or pull the plug in the lavatory. But, as the excitement had affected most of our tummies, you can imagine what the atmosphere was like when we had each paid a visit in succession. When something like that happens, heaps of other things seem to come at the same time as now. Number one was that the clock at the Vestertorn, which I always find so reassuring, did not strike. Number two was that Mr. Vosen, having left earlier than usual the previous evening, we didn't know definitely whether Ellie had been able to get hold of the key and had perhaps forgotten to shut the door. It was still evening and we were still in a state of uncertainty, although we certainly did feel a bit reassured by the fact that from about eight o'clock, when the burglar had alarmed the house, until half past ten, we had not heard a sound. On further reflection, it also seemed very unlikely to us that a thief would have forced open a door so early in the evening, while there were still people about in the street. Moreover, one of us got the idea that it was possible that the caretaker of the warehouse next door was still at work, since in the excitement and with the thin walls, one can easily imagine a mistake, and what's more, one's imagination can play a big part at such critical moments. So we all went to bed, but none of us could get to sleep. Daddy, as well as Mummy and Mr. Dusa, were awake, and without much exaggeration I can say that I hardly slept a wink. This morning the men went downstairs to see whether the outside door was still shut, and everything turned out to be quite safe. 
We gave everyone a detailed description of the nerve-wracking event. They all made fun of it, but it is easy to laugh at such things afterwards. Ellie was the only one who took us seriously. Saturday, 27 March, 1943. Dear Kitty, we have finished our shorthand course. Now we are beginning to practice speed. Aren't we getting clever? I must tell you more about my time-killing subjects. I call them such because we have got nothing else to do but make the days go by as quickly as possible, so that the end of our time here comes more quickly. I'm mad on mythology, and especially the gods of Greece and Rome. They think here that it is just a passing craze. They've never heard of an adolescent kid of my age being interested in mythology. Well, then I shall be the first. Mr. Von Don has a cold, or rather he has a little tickle in his throat. He makes a tremendous fuss about it, gargling with chamomile tea, painting his throat with tincture of myrrh, rubbing eucalyptus all over his chest, nose, teeth, and tongue, and then getting into an evil mood on top of it all. Rauter, one of the German big shots, has made a speech. All Jews must be out of the German-occupied countries before July 1. Between April 1 and May 1, the province of Utrecht must be cleaned out, as if the Jews were cockroaches. Between May 1 and June 1, the provinces of North and South Holland. These wretched people are sent to filthy slaughterhouses, like a herd of sick, neglected cattle. But I won't talk about it. I only get nightmares from such thoughts. One good little piece of news is that the German Department of the Labor Exchange has been set on fire by saboteurs. A few days after, the registrar's office went the same way. Men in German police uniforms gagged the guards and managed to destroy important papers. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 1 April 1943. Dear Kitty, I'm really not April fooling, see the date, but the opposite. Today I can easily quote the saying, Misfortunes never come singly. To begin with, Mr. Coupuis, the one who always cheers us up, has had hemorrhage of the stomach and has got to stay in bed for at least three weeks. Secondly, Ellie has flu. Thirdly, Mr. Volson is going to the hospital next week. He has probably got an abdominal ulcer. And fourthly, some important business conferences, the main points of which Daddy had discussed in detail with Mr. Coupuis, were due to be held, but now there isn't time to explain everything thoroughly to Mr. Crawler. The gentleman who had been expected duly arrived. Even before they came, Daddy was trembling with anxiety as to how the talks would go. If only I could be there, if only I was downstairs, he cried. Why don't you go and lie with one ear pressed against the floor? Then you'll be able to hear everything. Daddy's face cleared, and at half past ten yesterday morning, Margot and Pim, two ears are better than one, took up their positions on the floor. The talks were not finished in the morning, but by the afternoon Daddy was not in a fit state to continue the listening campaign. He was half paralyzed from remaining in so unusual and uncomfortable a position. I took his place at half past two, as soon as we heard voices in the passage. Margot kept me company. The talk at times was so long-winded and boring that quite suddenly I fell asleep on the cold, hard linoleum floor. Margot did not dare to touch me for fear they might hear us and talking was out of the question. I slept for a good half hour and then woke with a shock, having forgotten every word of the important discussions. Luckily, Margot had paid more attention. Yours, Anna. Anne Frank. This ends The Disc Diary of a two. Young Girl. Disc 3. Friday, 2 April, 1943. Dear Kitty... Oh, dear. I've got another terrible black mark against my name. I was lying in bed yesterday evening, waiting for Daddy to come and say my prayers with me and wish me good night, when Mummy came into my room, sat on my bed, and asked very nicely, Anna, Daddy can't come yet. Shall I say your prayers with you tonight? No, Mummy, I answered. Mummy got up, paused by my bed for a moment, and walked slowly towards the door. Suddenly she turned around and, with a distorted look on her face, said, I don't want to be cross. Love cannot be forced. There were tears in her eyes as she left the room. I lay still in bed, feeling at once that I had been horrible to push her away so rudely. 
but I knew, too, that I couldn't have answered differently. It simply wouldn't work. I felt sorry for Mummy, very, very sorry, because I had seen for the first time in my life that she minds my coldness. I saw the look of sorrow on her face when she spoke of love not being forced. It is hard to speak the truth, and yet it is the truth. She herself has pushed me away. Her tactless remarks and her crude jokes, which I don't find at all funny, have now made me insensitive to any love from her side. Just as I shrink at her hard words, so her heart, when she realized that the love between us was gone. She cried half the night and hardly slept at all. Daddy doesn't look at me, and if he does for a second, then I read in his eyes the words, How can you be so unkind? How can you bring yourself to cause your mother such sorrow? They expect me to apologize, but this is something I can't apologize for because I spoke the truth, and Mummy will have to know it sooner or later anyway. I seem, and indeed am, indifferent both to Mummy's tears and Daddy's looks, because for the first time they are both aware of something which I have always felt. I can only feel sorry for Mummy, who has now had to discover that I have adopted her own attitude. For myself, I remain silent and aloof, and I shall not shrink from the truth any longer, because the longer it is put off, the more difficult it will be for them when they do hear it. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 27 April, 1943. Dear Kitty, such quarrels that the whole house thunders. Mummy and I, the Von Dons and Daddy, Mummy and Mrs. Von Don, everyone is angry with everyone else. Nice atmosphere, isn't it? Anna's usual list of failings has been brought out again and fully ventilated. Mr. Vossen is already in the Binnengastwies Hospital. Mr. Kupwies is up again, the hemorrhage having stopped sooner than usual. He told us that the registrar's office received additional damage from the fire service, who, instead of just quenching the flames, soaked the whole place with water. I'm glad. The Carlton Hotel is smashed to bits. Two British planes loaded with incendiary bombs, fell right on top of the Ovitzierheim. Footnote. German Officers' Club. The whole Beetzelstraat Sengel corner is burned down. The air raids on German towns are growing in strength every day. We don't have a single quiet night. I've got dark rings under my eyes from lack of sleep. Our food is miserable. Dry bread and coffee substitute for breakfast. Dinner, spinach, or lettuce for a fortnight on end. Potatoes twenty centimeters long and tasting sweet and rotten. Whoever wants to follow a slimming course should stay in the secret annex. They complain bitterly upstairs, but we don't regard it as such a tragedy. All the men who fought in 1940 or were mobilized have been called up to work for de Führer as prisoners of war. Suppose they're doing that as a precaution against invasion. Saturday, yours, 1 Anna. May, 1943. Dear Kitty, if I just think of how we live here, I usually come to the conclusion that it is a paradise compared with how other Jews, who are not in hiding, must be living. Even so, later on, when everything is normal again, I shall be amazed to think that we, who were so spick and span at home, should have sunk to such a low level— by this I mean that our manners have declined. For instance, ever since we have been here, we have had one oilcloth on our table, which, owing to so much use, is not one of the cleanest. Admittedly, I often try to clean it with a dirty dishcloth, which is more whole than cloth. The table doesn't do us much credit either, in spite of hard scrubbing. The Vandans have been sleeping on the same flannelette sheet the whole winter— one can't wash it here because the soap powder we get on the ration isn't sufficient, and besides, it's not good enough. Daddy goes about in frayed trousers, and his tie is beginning to show signs of wear, too. Mummy's corsets have split today and are too old to be repaired, while Margot goes about in a brassiere two sizes too small for her. Mummy and Margot have managed the whole winter with three vests between them, and mine are so small that they don't even reach my tummy. Certainly these are all things which can be overcome. Still, I sometimes realize with a shock. How are we now, going about in worn-out things, from my pants down to Daddy's shaving brush, ever going to get back to our pre-war standards? They were banging away so much last night that four times I gathered all my belongings together. 
Today I have packed a suitcase with the most necessary things for an escape. But Mummy quite rightly says, Where will you escape to? The whole of Holland is being punished for the strikes which have been going on in many parts of the country. Therefore a state of siege has been declared, and every one gets one butter coupon less. What naughty little children! Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 18 May, 1943. Dear Kitty, I witnessed a terrific air battle between German and British planes. Unfortunately, a couple of the Allies had to jump from burning machines. Our milkman, who lives in Hofweg, saw four Canadians sitting by the roadside. One of them spoke fluent Dutch. He asked the milkman to give him a light for a cigarette and told him that the crew had consisted of six men. The pilot was burned to death, and their fifth man had hidden himself somewhere. The German police came and fetched the four perfectly fit men. I wonder how they managed to have such clear brains after that terrifying parachute trip. Although it is fairly warm, we have to light our fires every other day in order to burn vegetable peelings and refuse. We can't put anything in the garbage pails, because one must always think of the warehouse boy. How easily one could be betrayed by being a little careless. All students who wish either to get their degrees this year or continue their studies are compelled to sign that they are in sympathy with the Germans and approve of the new order. Eighty percent have refused to go against their consciences. Naturally, they had to bear the consequences. All the students who do not sign have to go to a labor camp in Germany. What will be left of the youth of the country if they have all got to do Mommy hard labor last Germany. night because of all the banging? I was in Pim's bed. Suddenly, Mrs. Von Don jumped out of the bed above us just as if Mushi had bitten her. A loud clap followed immediately. It sounded just as if an incendiary bomb had fallen beside my bed. I shrieked out, Light! Light! Pim turned on the lamp. I expected nothing less than to see the room ablaze within a few minutes. Nothing happened. We all hurried upstairs to see what was going on. Mr. and Mrs. Von Don had seen a red glow through the open window. He thought that there was a fire in the neighborhood, and she thought that our house had caught fire. When the clap came, Mrs. Von Don was already on her feet with her knees knocking. But nothing more happened, and we all crept back into our beds. Before a quarter of an hour had passed, the shooting started up again. Mrs. Von Don sat bolt upright at once and then went downstairs to Mr. Dussel's room, seeking there the rest which she could not find with her spouse. Dussel received her with the words, "'Come into my bed, my child,' which sent us off into uncontrollable laughter. The gunfire troubled us no longer. Our fears were banished. Yours, Anna. Sunday, 13 June, 1943. Dear Kitty, my birthday poem from Daddy is too good to keep from you. As Pim usually writes verses in German, Margot volunteered to translate it. Judge for yourself whether Margot didn't do it brilliantly. After the usual summary of the events of the year, this is how it ran. Though youngest here, you are no longer small. But life is very hard since one and all aspire to be your teacher. Thus and thus, we have experience. Take a tip from us. We know because we did it long ago. Elders are always better, you must know. At least that's been the rule since life began. Our personal faults are much too small to scan. This makes it easier to criticize the faults of others, which seem double size. Please bear with us, your parents, for we try to judge you fairly and with sympathy. Corrections sometimes take against your will, though it's like swallowing a bitter pill, which must be done if we're to keep the peace, while time goes by till all the suffering cease. You read and study nearly all the day who might have lived in such a different way. You're never bored, and bring us all fresh air. Your only moan is this— what can I wear? I have no knickers. All my clothes are small. My vest might be a loincloth, that is all. To put on shoes would mean to cut off toes. Oh, dear, I'm worried by so many woes. There was also a bit about food that Margot could not translate into rhyme, so I shall have to leave it out. Don't you think my birthday poem is good? I have been thoroughly spoiled in other ways and received a lot of lovely things. Among other things, a fat book on my pet subject, the mythology of Greece and Rome. I can't complain of a shortage of sweets, either. Everyone has broken into their last reserves. 
As the Benjamin of the family in hiding, I am really more honored than I deserve. Tuesday, yours 15 on. June, 1943. Dear Kitty, lots of things have happened, but I often think that all my uninteresting chatter bores you very much, and that you are glad not to receive too many letters. So I shall give you the news in brief. Mr. Vosen has not been operated on for his duodenal ulcer. When he was on the operating table, and they had opened him up, the doctors saw that he had cancer, which was far too advanced to operate. So they stitched him up again, kept him in bed for three weeks, and gave him good food and finally sent him home again. I do pity him terribly, and think it is rotten that we can't go out, otherwise I should certainly visit him frequently to cheer him up. It is a disaster for us that good old Vosen won't be able to keep us in touch with all that goes on, and all he hears in the warehouse— he was our best helper and security adviser. We miss him very much indeed. It will be our turn to hand in our radio next month. Coupuis has a clandestine baby set at home that he will let us have to take the place of our big Phillips. It certainly is a shame to have to hand in our lovely set, but in a house where people are hiding, one daren't, under any circumstances, take wanton risks and so draw the attention of the authorities. We shall have the little radio upstairs. On top of hidden Jews, clandestine money, and clandestine buying, we can add a clandestine radio. Everyone is trying to get hold of an old set and to hand that in instead of their source of courage. It is really true that as the news from outside gets worse, so the radio, with its miraculous voice, helps us to keep up our morale and to say again, Chins up, stick it out. Better times will come. Yours, Anna. Sunday, 11 July, 1943. Dear Kitty, to return to the upbringing theme for the umpteenth time, I must tell you that I am really trying to be helpful, friendly, and good, and to do everything I can so that the rain of rebukes dies down to a light summer drizzle. It is mighty difficult to be on such model behavior with people you can't bear, especially when you don't mean a word of it. But I do really see that I get on better by shamming a bit, instead of my old habit of telling everyone exactly what I think, although no one ever asked my opinion or attached the slightest importance to it. I often lose my cue and simply can't swallow my rage at some injustice, so that for four long weeks we hear nothing but an everlasting chatter about the cheekiest and most shameless girl on earth. Don't you think that I'm sometimes a cause for complaint? It's a good thing I'm not a grouser, because then I might get sour and bad-tempered. I have decided to let my shorthand go a bit, firstly to give me more time for my other subjects, and secondly because of my eyes. I'm so miserable and wretched, as I've become very short-sighted, and ought to have had glasses for a long time already. Phew, what an owl I should look! But you know, of course, in hiding one cannot. Yesterday everyone talked of nothing but Anna's eyes— because Mummy had suggested sending me to the oculist with Mrs. Coupuis. I shook in my shoes somewhat at this announcement, for it is no small thing to do. Go out of doors. Imagine it, in the street. Doesn't bear thinking about. I was petrified at first, then glad. But it doesn't go as easily as that, because all the people who would have to approve such a step could not reach an agreement quickly. All the difficulties and risks had first to be carefully weighed, although me up would have gone with me straight I got away. out my gray coat from the cupboard, but it was so small that it looked as if it belonged to my younger sister. I am really curious to know what will come of it all, but I don't think the plan will come off because the British have landed in Sicily now, and Daddy's once again hoping for a quick finish. Ellie gives Margot and me a lot of office work. It makes us both feel quite important, and it is a great help to her. Anyone can file away correspondence and write in the sales book, but we take special pains. Miep is just like a pack mule. She fetches and carries so much. Almost every day she manages to get hold of some vegetables for us and brings everything in shopping bags on her bicycle. We always long for Saturdays when our books come, just like little children receiving a present. Ordinary people simply don't know what books mean to us, shut up here. Reading, learning, and the radio are our amusements. Yours, Anna. Tuesday, 13 July, 1943. Dear Kitty, Yesterday afternoon, with Daddy's permission, 
I asked Dussel whether he would please be so good, being really very polite, as to allow me to use the little table in our room twice a week in the afternoons, from four o'clock till half past five. I sit there every day from half past two till four while Dussel sleeps, but otherwise the room plus table are out of bounds. Inside, in our common room, there is much too much going on. It is impossible to work there. And besides, Daddy likes to sit at the writing table and work too sometimes. So it was quite a reasonable request, and the question was put very politely. Now, honestly, what do you think the very learned Dussel replied? No. Just plain no. I was indignant and refused to be put off like that. So I asked him the reason for his no. But I was sent away with a flea in my ear. This was the barrage which followed. I have to work too. And if I can't work in the afternoons, then there is no time left for me at all. I must finish my task. Otherwise, I've started it all for nothing. Anyway, you don't work seriously at anything. Your mythology, now just what kind of work is that? Knitting and reading are not work either. I am at the table and shall stay there. My reply was, Mr. Dussel, I do work seriously, and there is nowhere else for me to work in the afternoons. I beg of you to kindly reconsider my request. With these words, the offended Anna turned her back on the very learned doctor, ignoring him completely. I was seething with rage, and thought Dussel frightfully rude, which he certainly was, and myself very friendly. In the evening, when I could get hold of Pym, I told him how it had gone off and discussed what I should do next, because I was not going to give in and preferred to clear it up myself. Pym told me how I ought to tackle the problem, but warned me that it would be better to leave it till the next day as I was so head up. I let this advice go to the winds and waited for Dussel after the dishes were done. Pym sat in the room next to us, which had a calming influence on me. I began. Mr. Dussel, I don't suppose you see any point in discussing the matter any more, but I must ask you to do so. Dussel then remarked with his sweetest smile, I am always and at all times prepared to discuss this matter, I went but on it talking, has already been though settled. continually interrupted by Dussel. When you first came here, we arranged that this room should be for both of us. If we were to divide it fairly, you would have the morning and I all the afternoon. But I don't even ask that much, and I think that my two afternoons are really perfectly reasonable. At this, Dussel jumped up as if someone had stuck a needle into him. You can't talk about your rights here at all. And where am I to go then? I shall ask Mr. Von Don whether he will build a small compartment in the attic. Then I can go and sit there. I simply can't work anywhere. With you, one always gets trouble. If your sister Margot, who after all has more reason to ask such a thing, would have come to me with the same questions, I should not think of refusing. But you... Then followed the business about the mythology and the knitting, and Anna was insulted again. However, she did not show it and let Jusel finish speaking. But you, one simply can't talk to you. You are so outrageously selfish. As long as you get what you want, you don't mind pushing everyone else to one side. I've never seen such a child. But after all, I suppose I shall be obliged to give you your own way, because otherwise I shall be told later on that Anna Frank failed her exam because Mr. Jusel would not give up the table for her. It went on and on. And finally, it was such a torrent I could hardly keep pace with it. At one moment, I thought, in a minute, I'll give him such a smack in the face that he'll fly up to the ceiling together with his lies. But the next moment, I said to myself, keep calm. Such a fellow isn't worth getting worked up about. After giving final vent to his fury, Master Dussel left the room with an expression of mixed wrath and triumph, his coat stuffed with food. I dashed to Daddy and told him all that he had not already heard of the story. Pym decided to talk to Dussel the same evening, which he did. They talked for over half an hour. The theme of the conversation was something like this. First of all, they talked about whether Anna should sit at the table, yes or no. Daddy said that he and Dussel had already discussed the subject once before, when he had professed to agree with Dussel in order not to put him in the wrong in front of the young. But Daddy had not thought it fair then. Dussel thought that I should not speak as if he was an intruder who tried to monopolize everything. But Daddy stuck up for me firmly over that, because he had heard for himself that I had not breathed the word of such a thing. To and fro it went, Daddy defending my selfishness and my trifling work, Dussel grumbling continually. 
Finally, Dussel had to give in after all, and I had the opportunity of working undisturbed until five o'clock for two afternoons a week. Dussel looked down his nose very much, didn't speak to me for two days, and still had to go and sit at the table from five till half past, frightfully childish. A person of fifty-four who is still so pedantic and small-minded must be so by nature and will never improve. Friday, yours, sixteen July, nineteen forty-three. Dear Kitty, burglars again, but real this time. This morning, Pater went to the warehouse at seven o'clock as usual, and at once noticed that both the warehouse door and the door opening onto the street were ajar. He told Pym, who tuned the radio in the private office to Germany, and locked the door. Then they went upstairs together. The standing orders for such times were observed as usual. No taps to be turned on, therefore no washing, silence, everything to be finished by eight o'clock, and no lavatory. We were all very glad that we had slept so well and had not heard anything. Not until half-past eleven did we learn from Mr. Coupuis that the burglars had pushed in the outer door with a crowbar and had forced the warehouse door. However, they did not find much to steal, so they tried their luck upstairs. They stole two cash boxes containing forty florins, postal orders, and checkbooks, and then, worst of all, all the coupons for one hundred and fifty kilos of sugar. Mr. Coupuis thinks that they belong to the same gang as the ones who tried all three doors six weeks ago. They were unsuccessful then. It has caused rather a stir in the building— but the secret annex can't seem to go on without sensations like this. We were very glad that the typewriters and money in our wardrobe, where they are brought upstairs every evening, were safe. Yours, Anna. Monday, 19 July, 1943. Dear Kitty, North Amsterdam was very heavily bombed on Sunday. The destruction seems to be terrible. Whole streets lie in ruins, and it will take a long time before all the people are dug out. Up till now there are two hundred dead and countless wounded. The hospitals are crammed. You hear of children lost in the smoldering ruins looking for their parents. I shudder when I recall the dull droning rumble in the distance, which for us marked the approaching destruction. Yours, Anna. Friday, 23 July, 1943. Dear Kitty, Just for fun, I'm going to tell you each person's first wish when we are allowed to go outside again. Margot and Mr. Von Don long more than anything for a hot bath filled to overflowing and want to stay in it for half an hour. Mrs. Von Don wants to go and eat cream cakes immediately. Dussel thinks of nothing but seeing Lotcha, his wife. Mummy of her cup of coffee. Daddy is going to visit Mr. Volson first. Pater, the town in a cinema. While I should find it so blissful, I should know where to start. But most of all, I long for a home of our own to be able to move freely and to have some help with my work again at last. In other words, school. Ellie has offered to get us some fruit. It costs next to nothing. Grapes, five florins per kilo. Gooseberries, point seven florins per pound. One peach, a half a florin. One kilo melon, one and a half florins. Footnote. Equivalent prices, in order, would be approximately a dollar and forty cents, Twenty-one cents, fourteen cents, and forty-two cents. Then you see in the newspapers every evening in bold letters, Play fair and keep prices down. Monday, yours, 26 Anna. July, 1943. Dear Kitty, Nothing but tumult and uproar yesterday. We are still very head up about it all. You might really ask, Does a day go by without some excitement? We had the first warning siren while we were at breakfast, but we don't give a hoot about that. It only means that the planes are crossing the coast. After breakfast, I went and lay down for an hour as I had a bad headache. Then I went downstairs. It was about two o'clock. Margot had finished her office work at half past two. She had not packed her things together when the sirens began to wail, so upstairs I went again with her. It was high time, for we had not been upstairs five minutes when they began shooting hard, so much so that we went and stood in the passage. And yes, the house rumbled and shook, and down came the bombs. I clasped my escape bag close to me, more because I wanted to have something to hold than with the idea of escaping, because there's nowhere we can go. If ever we come to the extremity of fleeing from here, the street would be just as dangerous as an air raid. 
This one subsided after half an hour, but the activity in the house increased. Pater came down from his lookout post in the attic. Dusa was in the main office. Mrs. Von Don felt safe in the private office. Mr. Von Don had been watching from the loft, and we on the landing dispersed ourselves too. I went upstairs to see rising above the harbor the columns of smoke Mr. Von Don had told us about. Before long you could smell burning, and outside it looked as if a thick mist hung everywhere. Although such a big fire is not a pleasant sight, luckily for us it was all over, and we went about our respective tasks. That evening at dinner, another air raid alarm. It was a nice meal, but my hunger vanished, simply at the sound of the alarm. Nothing happened, and three quarters of an hour later it was all clear. The dishes were stacked, ready to be done, Air raid warning. Akak fire, an awful lot of planes. Oh, dear me, twice in one day, that's too much, we all thought. But that didn't help at all. Once again, the bombs rained down, the other side this time, on Sheepole, according to the British. Footnote. Sheepole is the Amsterdam airport. The planes dived and climbed. We heard the hum of their engines, and it was very gruesome. Each moment I thought, once falling now, here it comes. I can assure you that when I went to bed at nine o'clock, I couldn't hold my leg still. I woke up at the stroke of twelve. Planes. Dusa was undressing. I didn't let that put me off, and at the first shot, I leaped out of bed wide awake. Two hours with Daddy, and still they kept coming. Then they ceased firing, and I was able to go to bed. I fell asleep at half past two. Seven o'clock. I sat up in bed with a start. Mr. Von Don was with Daddy. Burglars was my first thought. I heard Mr. Von Don say everything. I thought that everything had been stolen. But no, this time it was wonderful news, such as we have not heard for months, perhaps in all the war years. Mussolini has resigned. The King of Italy has taken over the government. We jumped for joy. After the terrible day yesterday, at last something good again. And hope. Hope for it to end. Hope for peace. Crawler called in and told us that Fokers has been badly damaged. Meanwhile, we had another air raid alarm with planes overhead and one more warning siren. I'm just about choked with alarms, very tired and don't feel a bit like work. But now the suspense over Italy will awaken the hope that it will soon end, perhaps even this year. Thursday, 29 on. July, 1943. Dear Kitty, Mrs. Von Don, Dussel, and I were doing the dishes, and I was extraordinarily quiet, which hardly ever happens, so they would have been sure to notice. In order to avoid questions, I quickly sought a fairly neutral topic, and thought that the book Henry from the Other Side would meet the need. But I had made a mistake. If Mrs. Von Don doesn't pounce on me, then Mr. Dussel does. This is what it came to. Mr. Dussel had specially recommended us this book as being excellent. Margot and I thought it was anything but excellent. The boy's character was certainly well drawn, but the rest... I had better gloss over that. I said something to that effect while we were washing the dishes, but that brought me a packet of trouble. How can you understand the psychology of a man? Of a child is not so difficult. You are much too young for a book like that. Why, even a man of twenty would not be able to grasp it. Why did he so especially recommend this book to Margot and me? Now, Dussel and Mrs. Von Don continued together. You know much too much about things that are unsuitable for you. You've been brought up all wrong. Later on, when you are older, you won't enjoy anything. Then you'll say, I read that in books twenty years ago. You had better make haste if you want to get a husband or fall in love, or everything is sure to be a disappointment to you. You are already proficient in the theory. It's only the practice that you still lack. I suppose it's their idea of a good upbringing to always try to set me against my parents, because that is what they often do. And to tell a girl of my age nothing about grown-up subjects is an equally fine method. I see the results of that kind of upbringing frequently and all too clearly. I could have slapped both their faces at that moment as they stood there making a fool of me. I was beside myself with rage, and I'm just counting the days until I'm rid of those people. Mrs. Von Don is a nice one. She sets a fine example. 
she certainly sets one, a bad one. She is well known as being very pushing, selfish, cunning, calculating, and is never content. I can also add vanity and coquetry to the list. There is no question about it. She is an unspeakably disagreeable person. I could write whole chapters about Madame. And who knows? Perhaps I will some day. Anyone can put on a fine coat of varnish outside. Mrs. Von Don is friendly to strangers, and especially men. So it is easy to make a mistake when you have only known her for a short time. Mummy thinks she is too stupid to waste words over. Margot too unimportant. Pym too ugly. Literally and figuratively. And I, after long observation, for I was never prejudiced from the start, have come to the conclusion that she is all three and a lot more. She has so many bad qualities, why should I even begin about one of them? Yours, Anna. P.S. Will the reader take into consideration that when this story was written, the writer had not cooled Tuesday, down from her 3 theory. August 1943. Dear Kitty, political news excellent. In Italy, the fascist party has been banned. The people are fighting the fascists in many places. Even the army is actually taking part in the battle. Can a country like that wage war against England? We've just had a third air raid. I clenched my teeth together to make myself feel courageous. Mrs. Von Don, who has always said, A terrible end is better than no end at all, is the greatest coward of us all now. She was shaking like a leaf this morning, and even burst into tears. When her husband, with whom she has just made it up after a week's squabbling, comforted her, the expression on her face alone almost made me feel sentimental. Mushi has proved that keeping cats has disadvantages as well as advantages. The whole house is full of fleas, and the plague gets worse every day. Mr. Coupuis has scattered yellow powder in every nook and corner, but the fleas don't seem to mind a bit. It's making us all quite nervous. One keeps imagining an itch on one's arms, legs, and various parts of the body— which is why quite a lot of us are doing gymnastics, so as to be able to look at the back of our necks or legs while standing up. Now we're being paid back for not being more supple. We're too stiff to even turn our heads properly. We gave up real gymnastics long ago. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 4 August, 1943. Dear Kitty, now that we have been in the secret annex for over a year, you know something of our lives— but some of it is quite indescribable. There is so much to tell. Everything is so different from ordinary times and from ordinary people's lives. But still, to give you a closer look into our lives, now and again I intend to give you a description of an ordinary day. Today I'm beginning with the evening and night. Nine o'clock in the evening. The bustle of going to bed in the secret annex begins, and it is always really quite a business— Chairs are shoved about, beds are pulled down, blankets unfolded. Nothing remains where it is during the day. I sleep on the little divan, which is not more than one and a half meters long, so chairs have to be used to lengthen it. An eider-down, sheets, pillows, blankets, are all fetched from Dussel's bed where they remain during the day. One hears terrible creaking in the next room, Margot's concertina bed being pulled out, Again, divan, blankets, and pillows, everything is done to make the wooden slats a bit more comfortable. It sounds like thunder above, but it is only Mrs. Von Don's bed. This is shifted to the window, you see, in order to give Her Majesty in the pink bed jacket fresh air to tickle After her date finished, nostrils. I step into the washing cubicle, where I give myself a thorough wash and general toilet. It occasionally happens, only in the hot weeks or months, that there is a tiny flea floating in the water— then teeth cleaning, hair curling, manicure, and my cotton wool pads with hydrogen peroxide to bleach black mustache hairs. All this under half an hour. Half past nine. Quickly into dressing gown, soap in one hand, potty, hairpins, pants, curlers, and cotton wool in the other, I hurry out of the bathroom. But usually I'm called back once for the various hairs which decorate the wash basin in graceful curves, but which are not approved of by the next person. Ten o'clock. Put up the blackout. Good night. For at least a quarter of an hour there is creaking of beds and a sighing of broken springs. Then all is quiet. At least, that is, if our neighbors upstairs don't quarrel in bed. Half past eleven. 
The bathroom door creaks. A narrow strip of light falls into the room. A squeak of shoes, a large coat, even larger than the man inside it. Dusel returns from his night work in Crawler's office. Shuffling on the floor for ten minutes, crackle of paper, that is the food which has to be stowed away, and a bed is made. Then the form disappears again, and one only hears suspicious noises from the lavatory from time to time. Three o'clock. I have to get up for a little job in the metal pot under my bed, which is on a rubber mat for safety's sake, in case of leakage. When this has to take place, I always hold my breath as it clatters into the tin like a brook from a mountain. When the pot is returned to its place and the figure in the white nightgown, which evokes the same cry from Margot every evening, oh, that indecent nightdress, steps back into bed. Then a certain person lies awake for about a quarter of an hour, listening to the sounds of the night, firstly to whether there might not be a burglar downstairs, then to the various beds, above, next door, and in my room, from which one is usually able to make out how the various members of the household are sleeping, or how they pass the night in wakefulness. The latter is certainly not pleasant, especially when it concerns a member of the family by the name of Dussel. First, I hear a sound like a fish gasping for breath. This is repeated nine of ten times. Then, with much ado and interchanged with little smacking sounds, the lips are moistened, followed by a lengthy twisting and turning in bed and rearranging of pillows. Five minutes perfect peace, and then the same sequence of events unfolds itself at least three times more, after the doctor has soothed himself to sleep again for a little while. It can also happen that we get a bit of shooting in the night, varying between one o'clock and four. I never really realize it, until from habit I am already standing at my bedside. Sometimes I'm so busy dreaming that I'm thinking about French irregular verbs or a quarrel upstairs. It is some time before I begin to realize that guns are firing, and that I am still in the room. But it usually happens as described above. I quickly grab a pillow and handkerchief, put on my dressing gown and slippers, and scamper to Daddy, like Margot wrote in this birthday poem. The first shot sounds at dead of night. Hush! Look! A door creaks open wide. A little girl glides into sight, clasping a pillow to her side. Once landed in the big bed, the worst is over, except that the firing gets very bad. Quarter to seven. Brrr. The alarm clock that raises its voice at any hour of the day, if one asks for it, and sometimes when one doesn't. Crack, ping, Mrs. Van Don has turned it off. Creak, Mr. Van Don gets up, puts on water, and then full speed to the bathroom. Quarter past seven. The door creaks again. Dussel can go to the bathroom. Once alone, I take down the blackout, and a new day in the secret annex has begun. Thursday, yours, 5 on. August, 1943. Dear Kitty, today I am going to take lunchtime. It is half past twelve. The whole mixed crowd breathes again. The warehouse boys have gone home now. Above, one can hear the noise of Mrs. Von Don's vacuum cleaner on her beautiful and only carpet. Margot goes with a few books under her arm for her Dutch lesson, for children who make no progress, because that's Dussel's attitude. Pim goes into a corner with his inseparable Dickens to try and find peace somewhere. Mummy hurries upstairs to help the industrious housewife, and I go to the bathroom to tidy it up a bit, and myself at the same time. Quarter to one. The place is filling up. First Mr. Von Santen, then Coupuis or Crawler, Ellie, and sometimes me up as well. One o'clock. We're all sitting listening to the BBC, seated around the baby wireless, these are the only times when the members of the secret annex do not interrupt each other, because now someone is speaking whom even Mr. Von Don can't interrupt. Quarter past one. The great share-out. Everyone from below gets a cup of soup, and if there is ever a pudding, some of that as well. Mr. Von Santen is happy and goes to sit on the divan or lean against the writing table. Newspaper, cup, and usually the cat beside him. If one of the three is missing, he's sure to protest. Coupuis tells us the latest news from town. He is certainly an excellent source of information. Crawler comes helter-skelter upstairs, 
a short, firm knock on the door, and in he comes rubbing his hands, according to his mood, in a good temper and talkative, or bad-tempered and quiet. Quarter to two. Everyone rises from the table and goes about his own business, Margot and Mummy to the dishes, Mr. and Mrs. Von Don to their divan, Pater up to the attic, Daddy to the divan downstairs, Dussel to his bed, and Anna to her work. Then follows the most peaceful hour. Everyone is asleep. No one is disturbed. Dussel dreams of lovely food. The expression on his face gives this away. But I don't look long, because the time goes so fast. And at four o'clock, the botanic doctor is standing, clock in hand, because I'm one minute late in clearing the table for him. Yours, Anna. Monday, 9 August, 1943. Dear Kitty, to continue the secret annex daily timetable, I shall now describe the evening meal. Mr. Von Don begins. He is first to be served, takes a lot of everything if it is what he likes, usually talks at the same time, always gives his opinion as the only one worth listening to, and once he has spoken it, it is irrevocable. Because if anyone dares to question it, then he flares up at once. Oh, he can spit like a cat. I'd rather not argue, I can tell you. If you've once tried, you don't try again. He has the best opinion. He knows the most about everything. All right, then, he has got brains, but self-satisfaction has reached a high Madame. grade with this gentleman. Really, I should remain silent. Some days, especially if there is a bad mood coming on, you can't look at her face. On closer examination, she is the guilty one in all the arguments, not the subject. Oh, no, everyone prefers to remain aloof over that. But one could perhaps call her the kindler. Stirring up trouble, that's fun. Mrs. Frank against Anna, Margot against Daddy, doesn't go quite so easily. But now at the table, Mrs. Von Don doesn't go short, although she thinks so at times. The tiniest potatoes the sweetest mouthful, the best of everything, picking over is her system. The others will get their turn as long as I have the best. Then talking. Whether anyone is interested, whether they are listening or not, that doesn't seem to matter. I suppose she thinks everyone is interested in what Mrs. Von Don says. Coquettish smiles, behaving as if one knew everything, giving everyone a bit of advice and encouragement that's sure to make a good impression. But if you look longer, then the good soon wears off. One, she is industrious. Two, gay. Three, a coquette. And occasionally pretty. This is Petronella Van Don. The third table companion. One doesn't hear much from him. Young Mr. Van Don is very quiet and doesn't draw much attention to himself. As for appetite, a Dana Edean vessel which is never full, and after the heartiest meal declares quite calmly that he could have eaten double. Number four, Margot. Eats like a little mouse and doesn't talk at all. The only things that go down are vegetables and fruit. Spoiled is the Von Don's judgment. Not enough fresh air and games, our opinion. Beside her, Mummy. Good appetite, very talkative. No one has the impression, as Mrs. Von Don, this is the housewife. What is the difference? Well, Mrs. Von Don does the cooking, and Mummy washes up and polishes. Number six and seven. I won't say much about Daddy and me. The former is the most unassuming of all at table. He looks first to see if everyone else has something. He needs nothing himself, for the best things are for the children. He is the perfect example. And sitting beside him, the secret annex is bundle of nerves. Dr. Dussel helps himself, never looks up, eats and doesn't talk. And if one must talk, then for heaven's sake, let it be about food. You don't quarrel about it, you only brag. Enormous helpings go down, and the word no is never heard, never when the food is gone, and not often when it's bad. Trousers wrapping his chest, red coat, black bedroom slippers, and horn-rimmed spectacles. That is how one sees him at the little table always working, alternated only by his afternoon nap, food, and his favorite spot, the lavatory. Three, four, five times a day, someone stands in patiently in front of the door and wriggles, hopping from one foot to the other, hardly able to contain himself. Does it disturb him? Not a bit. 
from quarter past seven till half past, from half past twelve till one o'clock, from two till quarter past, from four till quarter past, from six till quarter past, and from half past eleven until twelve. One can make a note of it. These are the regular sitting times. He won't come off or pay any heed to an imploring voice at the door, giving warning of approaching disaster. Number nine isn't a member of the secret annex family, but rather a companion in the house and at table. Ellie has a healthy appetite, leaves nothing on her plate, and is not picky and choosy. She is easy to please, and that is just what gives us pleasure. Cheerful and good tempered, willing and good natured, these are her characteristics. Tuesday, Yours on. 10 August 1943. Dear Kitty, New idea. I talk more to myself than to the others at mealtimes, which is to be recommended for two reasons. Firstly, because everyone is happy if I don't chatter the whole time. And secondly, I needn't get annoyed about other people's opinions. I don't think my opinions are stupid, and the others do, so it is better to keep them to myself. I do just the same if I have to eat something that I simply can't stand. I put my plate in front of me, pretend that it is something delicious, look at it as little as possible, and before I know where I am, it is gone. When I get up in the morning, also a very unpleasant process, I jump out of bed thinking to myself, you'll be back in a second, go to the window, take down the blackout, sniff at the crack of the window until I feel a bit of fresh air, and I'm awake. The bed is turned down as quickly as possible, and then the temptation is removed. Do you know what mummy calls this sort of thing? The art of living. That's an odd expression. For the last week we've all been in a bit of a muddle about time, because our dear and beloved Vestrator and clock bell has apparently been taken away for war purposes, so that neither by day nor night do we ever know the exact time. I still have some hope that they will think up a substitute— tin, copper, or some such thing, to remind the neighborhood of the clock. Whether I'm upstairs or down, or wherever I am, my feet are the admiration of all, glittering in a pair of, for these days, exceptionally fine shoes. Miette managed to get hold of them secondhand for twenty-seven and a half florins, wine-colored suede leather with fairly high wedge heels. I feel as if I'm on stilts and look much taller than I am. Dussel has indirectly endangered our lives. He actually let Miette bring a forbidden book for him, one which abuses Mussolini and Hitler. On the way, she happened to be run into by an SS car. She lost her temper and shouted, Miserable wretches! and rode on. It is better not to think of what might have happened if she had had to go to their headquarters. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 18 August, 1943. Dear Kitty, the title for this piece is The Communal Task of the Day, Potato Peeling. One person fetches the newspapers, another the knives, keeping the best for himself, of course, a third potatoes, and the fourth a pan of water. Mr. Dussel begins, does not always scrape well, but scrapes incessantly, glancing right and left. Does everyone do it the way he does? No. Ah, now look here. I take the knife in my hand like this, scrape from the top downwards. No, not like that, like this. I get on better like this, Mr. Dussel, I remark timidly. But still, this is the best way. But you can't take this from me. Naturally, I don't care a bit. Ah, but you must know for yourself. We scrape on. I look slyly once in my neighbor's direction. He shakes his head thoughtfully once more, over I me, I suppose, again. but is silent. now I look to the other side, where Daddy is sitting. For him, scraping potatoes is not just a little odd job, but a piece of precision work. When he reads, he has a deep wrinkle at the back of his head. But if he helps prepare potatoes, beans, or any other vegetables, then it seems as if nothing else penetrates. Then he has on his potato face, and he would never hand over an imperfectly scraped potato— it's out of the question when he makes that face. I work on again, and then just look up for a second. I know it already. Mrs. Von Don is trying to attract Jusel's attention. First she looks in his direction, and Jusel appears not to notice anything. Then she winks an eye. Jusel works on. Then she laughs. Jusel doesn't look up. Then Mummy laughs, too. Jusel takes no notice. 
Mrs. Von Don has not achieved anything, so she has to think of something else. A pause, and then, Putty, do put on an apron. Tomorrow I shall have to get all the spots out of your suit. I'm not getting myself dirty. Another moment's silence. Putty, why don't you sit down? I'm comfortable standing up and prefer it. Pause. Putty, look. Do you spot shun? You are making a mess. Yes, Mammy, I'm being careful. Mrs. Von Don searches for another subject. I say, Putty, why aren't there any English air raids now? Because the weather is bad, Carely. But it was lovely yesterday they didn't fly them either. Let's not talk about it. Why, surely one can talk about it or give one's opinion. No. Why ever not? Do be quiet, Mummishin. Mr. Frank always answers his wife, doesn't he? Mr. Von Don wrestles with himself. This is his tender spot. It's something he can't take, and Mrs. Vaughn begins again. The invasion seems as if it will never come. Mr. Von Don goes white. When Mrs. Von Don sees this, she turns red, but goes on again. The British do nothing. The bomb explodes. And now hold your tongue, Donner Wetter noch einmal. Mommy can hardly hold back her laughter. I look straight in front of me. This sort of thing happens nearly every day, unless they have just had a very bad quarrel, because then they both keep their mouths shut. I have to go up to the attic to fetch some potatoes. Peter is busy there delousing the cat. He looks up. The cat notices. Pop! He has disappeared through the open window into the gutter. Peter swears. I laugh and disappear. Friday, 20 August, Yours 1943. Dear Kitty, the men in the warehouse go home sharp at half past five, and then we are free. Half past five. Ellie comes in to give us our evening freedom. Immediately we begin to make some headway with our work. First, I go upstairs with Ellie, where she usually begins by having a bite from our second course. Before Ellie is seated, Mrs. Bondon begins thinking of things she wants. It soon comes out. Oh, Ellie, I have only one little wish. Ellie winks at me. Whoever comes upstairs, Mrs. Von Don never misses a single opportunity of letting them know what she wants. That must be one of the reasons why none of them like coming upstairs. Quarter to six. Ellie departs. I go two floors down to have a look around, first to the kitchen, then to the private office, after that the coal hole to open the trap door for Mushi. After a long tour of inspection, I land up in Crawler's room. Fondant is looking in all the drawers and portfolios to find the day's post. Pater is fetching the warehouse key and Bosch. Pim is hauling the typewriters upstairs. Margot is looking for a quiet spot to do her office work. Mrs. Vondon puts a kettle on the gas ring. Mummy is coming downstairs with a pan of potatoes. Each one knows his own job. Pater soon returns from the warehouse. The first question is bread. This is always put in the kitchen cupboard by the ladies, but it is not there. Forgotten? Pater offers to look in the main office. He crouches in front of the door to make himself as small as possible and crawls toward the steel lockers on hands and knees so as not to be seen from outside, gets the bread, which had been put there, and disappears. At least he wants to disappear, but before he quite realizes what has happened, Mushi has jumped over him and gone and sat right under the writing table. Pater looks all around. Aha, he sees him there. He crawls into the office again and pulls the animal by its tail. Mushi spits. Peter sighs. What has he achieved? Now Mushi is sitting right up by the window cleaning himself, very pleased to have escaped Pater. Now Pater is holding a piece of bread under the cat's nose as a last decoy. Mushi will not be tempted, and the door closes. I stood and watched it all through the crack at the door. We work on. Rat tat tat. Three taps means a meal. Yours, Anna. Monday, 23 August 1943. Dear Kitty, Continuation of the Secret Annex Daily Timetable. As the clock strikes half past eight in the morning, Margot and Mummy are jittery. Shh, Daddy, quiet. Otto, shh. Pim, it is half past eight. Come back here. You can't run any more water. Walk quietly. These are the various cries to Daddy in the bathroom. 
As the clock strikes half past eight, he has to be in the living room. Not a drop of water, no lavatory, no walking about, everything quiet. As long as none of the office staff are there, everything can be heard in the warehouse. The door is opened upstairs at twenty minutes past eight, and shortly after there are three taps on the floor. Anna's porridge. I climb upstairs and fetch my puppy dog plate. Down in my room again, everything goes at terrific speed. Do my hair, put away my noisy tin potty, bed in place. Hush, the clock strikes. Upstairs, Mrs. Von Don has changed her shoes and is shuffling about in bedroom slippers. Mr. Von Don, too. Now we have a little bit of real family life. I want to read or work, Margot as well, also Daddy and Mummy. Daddy is sitting with Dickens and the dictionary, naturally, on the edge of the sagging, squeaky bed where there aren't even any decent mattresses. Two bolsters on top of each other will also serve the purpose. Then he thinks, mustn't have them, then I'll manage without. Once he's reading, he doesn't look up or about him, laughs every now and then, takes awful trouble to get Mummy interested in a little story. Answer, I haven't got time now. Looks disappointed for just a second, then reads on again. A little later, when he comes to something extra amusing, he tries it again. You must read this, Mummy. Mummy sits on the upclap bed, reads, sews, knits, or works, whatever she feels like. Footnote. Upclap. Dutch type of bed which folds against the wall to look like a bookcase with curtains hanging before it. She suddenly thinks of something, just says it quickly. Anna, do you know... Margot, just jot down. After a while, peace returns once more. Margot closes her book with a clap. Daddy raises his eyebrows into a funny curve. His reading wrinkle deepens again, and he is lost in his book once more. Mummy begins to chatter with Margot. I become curious and listen, too. Pim is drawn into the discussion. Nine o'clock, breakfast. Yours, Anna. Friday, 10 September, 1943. Dear Kitty, every time I write to you, something special seems to have happened, but they are more often unpleasant than pleasant things. However, now there is something wonderful going on. Last Wednesday evening, 8 September, we sat around listening to the 7 o'clock news, and the first thing we heard was, Here follows the best news of the whole war. Italy has capitulated. Italy's unconditional surrender. The Dutch program from England began at quarter past eight. Listeners, an hour ago I had just finished writing the chronicle of the day, when the wonderful news of Italy's capitulation came in. I can tell you that I have never deposited my notes in the waste paper basket with such joy. God save the King, the American National Anthem, the Internationale were played. As always, the Dutch program was uplifting, but not too optimistic. Still, we have troubles, too. It's about Mr. Coupuis. As you know, we are all very fond of him. He is always cheerful and amazingly brave, although he is never well has a lot of pain, and is not allowed to eat much or do much walking. When Mr. Coupuis enters, the sun begins to shine, Mummy said just recently, and she is quite right. Now he has had to go into the hospital for a very unpleasant abdominal operation, and will have to stay there for at least four weeks. You really ought to have seen how he said goodbye to us, just as usual. He might have simply been going out to do a bit of shopping. Thursday, yours, 16 Anna. September, 1943. Dear Kitty, relations between us here are getting worse all the time. At mealtimes, no one dares to open their mouths, except to allow a mouthful of food to slip in, because whatever is said, you either annoy someone or it is misunderstood. I swallow valerian pills every day against worry and depression, but it doesn't prevent me from being even more miserable the next day. A good hearty laugh would help more than ten valerian pills. But we've almost forgotten how to laugh. I feel afraid sometimes that from having to be so serious, I'll grow a long face and my mouth will droop at the corners. The others don't get any better either. Everyone looks with fear and misgivings towards that great terror, winter. Another thing that does not cheer us up is the fact that the warehouseman, V.M., is becoming suspicious about the secret annex, we really wouldn't mind what V.M. thought of the situation if he wasn't so exceptionally inquisitive 
difficult to fob off, and, moreover, not to be trusted. One day, Crawler wanted to be extra careful, put on his coat at ten minutes to one, and went to the chemist round the corner. He was back in less than five minutes, and sneaked like a thief up the steep stairs that led straight to us. At a quarter past one, he wanted to go again, but Ellie came to warn him that V.M. was in the office. He did a right-about turn and sat with us until half-past one. Then he took off his shoes and went in stockinged feet to the front attic door, went downstairs step by step, and after balancing there for a quarter of an hour to avoid creaking, he landed safely in the office, having entered from the outside. Ellie had been freed of V.M. in the meantime and came up to us to fetch Crawler, but he had already been gone a long time. He was still on the staircase with his shoes off. Whatever would the people in the street have thought if they had seen the manager putting on his shoes outside? Gosh, the manager in his socks. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 29 September, 1943. Dear Kitty, it is Mrs. Von Don's birthday. We gave her a pot of jam as well as coupons for cheese, meat, and bread. From her husband, Dussel, and our protectors, she received things to eat and flowers. Such are the times we live in. Ellie had a fit of nerves this week. She had been sent out so often. Time and again she had been asked to go and fetch something quickly, which met yet another errand or made her feel that she had done something wrong. If you just think that she still has to finish her office work downstairs, that Coupuis is ill, Miep at home with a cold, and that she herself has a sprained ankles, love worries, and a grumbling father, then it's no wonder she's at her wit's end. We comforted her and said that if she puts her foot down once or twice and says she has no time, then the shopping lists will automatically get shorter. There's something wrong with Mr. Von Don again. I can see it coming on already. Daddy is very angry for some reason or other. Oh, what kind of explosion is hanging over us now? If only I wasn't mixed up so much with all these rows. If I could only get away, they'll drive us crazy before long. Sunday, 17 Yours, October, Anna. 1943. Dear Kitty, Coupuis is back again, thank goodness. He still looks rather pale, but in spite of this sets out cheerfully to sell clothes for Von Don. It is an unpleasant fact that the Von Dons have run right out of money. Mrs. Von Don won't part with a thing from her pile of coats, dresses, and shoes. Mr. Von Don's suit isn't easily disposed of because he wants too much for it. The end of the story is not yet in sight. Mrs. Von Don will certainly have to part with her fur coat. They've had a terrific row upstairs about it, and now the reconciliation period of, oh, darling putty and precious curly has set in. I am dazed by all the abusive exchanges that have taken place in this virtuous house during the past month. Daddy goes about with his lips tightly pursed, and when anyone speaks to him he looks up startled, as if he is afraid he will have to patch up some tricky relationship again. Mummy has red patches on her cheeks from excitement. Margot complains of headaches, Dussel can't sleep, Mrs. Von Don growls as the whole day, and I'm going completely crazy. Quite honestly, I sometimes forget who we are quarreling with and with whom we've made it up. The only way to take one's mind off it all is to study, and I do a lot of that. Yours, Anna. Friday, 29 October, 1943. Dear Kitty, there have been resounding rows again between Mr. and Mrs. Von Don. It came about like this. As I have already told you, the Von Dons are at the end of their money. One day, some time ago now, Coupuis spoke about a furrier with whom he was on good terms. This gave Von Don the idea of selling his wife's fur coat. It's a fur coat made from rabbit skins, and she has worn it seventeen years. He got 325 florins for it, an enormous sum. However, Mrs. Von Don wanted to keep the money to buy new clothes after the war, and it took some doing before Mr. Von Don made it clear to her that the money was urgently needed for the household. The yells and screams, stamping and abuse, you can't possibly imagine it. It was frightening. My family stood at the bottom of the stairs, holding their breath, ready if necessary to drag them apart. All this shouting and weeping and nervous tension are so unsettling, and such a strain that in the evening I drop into my bed crying, thanking heaven that I sometimes have half an hour to myself. Mr. Coupuis is away again. His stomach gives him no peace. 
He doesn't even know whether it has stopped bleeding yet. For the first time, he was very down when he told us that he didn't feel well and was going home. All goes well with me on the whole, except that I have no appetite. I keep being told, you don't look at all well. I must say that they are doing their very best to keep me up to the mark. Grape sugar, cod liver oil, yeast tablets, and calcium have all been lined up. My nerves often get the better of me. It is especially on Sundays that I feel rotten. The atmosphere is so oppressive and sleepy and as heavy as lead. You don't hear a single bird singing outside, and a deadly closed silence hangs everywhere, catching hold of me as if it will drag me down deep into an underworld. At such times, Daddy, Mummy, and Margo leave me cold. I wander from one room to another, downstairs and up again, feeling like a songbird whose wings have been clipped and who is hurling himself in utter darkness against the bars of his cage. Go outside, laugh, and take a breath of fresh air, a voice cries within me. But I don't even feel a response any more. I go and lie in the divan and sleep to make the time pass more quickly. And the stillness and the terrible fear because there is no way of killing them. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 3 November, 1943. Dear Kitty, in order to give us something to do, which is also educational, Daddy applied for a prospectus from the Teacher's Institute in Leiden. Margot knows to the thick book at least three times without finding anything to her liking or to suit her purse. Daddy was quicker and wants a letter written to the Institute asking for a trial lesson in elementary Latin. To give me something new to begin as well, Daddy asked Coupuis for a children's Bible so that I could find out something about the New Testament at last. Do you want to give Anna a Bible for Hanukkah? asked Margot, somewhat perturbed. Yes, uh, I think St. Nicholas Day is a better occasion, answered Daddy. Jesus just doesn't go with Hanukkah. Yours, Anna. Anne this Frank, ends The Diary of a Young Girl, Disc 4. Monday evening, 8 November 1943. Dear Kitty, if you were to read my pile of letters, one after another, you would certainly be struck by the many different moods in which they are written. It annoys me that I am so dependent on the atmosphere here, but I'm certainly not the only one. We all find it the same. If I read a book that impresses me, I have to take myself firmly in hand before I mix with other people. Otherwise, they would think my mind rather queer. At the moment, as you've probably noticed, I'm going through a spell of being depressed. I really couldn't tell you why it is, but I believe it's just because I'm a coward. And that's what I keep bumping up against. This evening, while Ellie was still here, there was a long, loud, penetrating ring at the door. I turned white at once got a tummy ache and heart palpitations, all from fear. At night, when I'm in bed, I see myself alone in a dungeon, without mummy or daddy. Sometimes I wander by the roadside, or our secret annex is on fire, or they come and take us away at night. I see everything as if it is actually taking place, and this gives me the feeling that it may all happen to me very soon. Miep often says she envies us for possessing such tranquility here, that may be true, but she is not thinking about all our fears. I simply can't imagine that the world will ever be normal for us again. I do talk about after the war, but then it is only a castle in the air, something that will never really happen. If I think back to our old house, my girlfriends, the fun at school, it is just as if another person lived it all, not me. I see the eight of us with our secret annex as if we were a little piece of blue heaven, surrounded by heavy black rain clouds. The round, clearly defined spot where we stand is still safe, but the clouds gather more closely about us, and the circle which separates us from the approaching danger closes more and more tightly. Now we are so surrounded by danger and darkness that we bump against each other as we search desperately for a means of escape. We all look down below where people are fighting each other. We look above where it is quiet and beautiful. And meanwhile we are cut off by the great dark mass, which will not let us go upwards, but which stands before us as an impenetrable wall. It tries to crush us but cannot do so yet. 
I can only cry and implore. Oh, if only the black circle would recede and open the way for us. Thursday, Yours 11 on. November 1943. Dear Kitty, I have a good title for this chapter. Ode to my fountain pen in memoriam. My fountain pen has always been one of my most priceless possessions. I value it highly, especially for its thick nib, for I can only really write neatly with a thick nib. My fountain pen has had a very long and interesting pen life, which I will briefly tell you about. When I was nine, my fountain pen arrived in a packet, wrapped in cotton wool, as sample without value, all the way from Aachen, where my grandmother, the kind donor, used to live. I was in bed with flu, while February winds howled round the house. The glorious fountain pen had a red leather case, and was at once shown around to all my friends. I, Anna Frank, the proud owner of a fountain pen. When I was ten, I was allowed to take the pen to school, and the mistress went so far as to permit me to write with it. When I was eleven, however, my treasure had to be put away again because the mistress in the sixth form only allowed us to use school pens and ink pots. When I was twelve and went to the Jewish Lyceum, footnote, a type of secondary school specializing in the classics, common in most continental countries, my fountain pen received a new case in honor of the great occasion. It could take a pencil as well, and as it closed with a zipper looked much more impressive. At thirteen the fountain pen came with us to the secret annex, where it has raced through countless diaries and compositions for me. Now I am fourteen. We have spent our last year together. It was on a Friday afternoon after five o'clock. I had come out of my room and wanted to go and sit at the table to write, when I was roughly pushed on one side and had to make room for Margot and Daddy, who wanted to practice their Latin. The fountain pen remained on the table unused while, with a sigh, its owner contented herself with a tiny little corner of the table and started rubbing beans. Bean rubbing is making moldy beans decent again. I swept the floor at a quarter to six and threw the dirt together with the bad beans into a newspaper and into the stove. A terrific flame leaped out, and I thought it was grand that the fire should burn up so well when it was practically out. All was quiet again. The Latinites had finished, and I went and sat at the table to clear up my writing things. But look as I might, there was not a trace of the thing. Perhaps it fell into the stove together with the beans, Margot suggested. Oh, no, of course not, I answered. When my fountain pen didn't turn up that evening, however, we all took it that it had been burned. All the more as celluloid is terribly inflammable. And so it was. Our unhappy fears were confirmed. When Daddy did the stove the following morning, the clip used for fastening was found among the ashes. Not a trace of the gold nib was found. It must have melted and stuck to some stone or other, Daddy thought. I have one consolation, although a slender one. My fountain pen has been cremated, just what I want later. Wednesday, Yours, 17 I. November 1943. Dear Kitty, shattering things are happening. Diphtheria reigns in Ellie's home, so she is not allowed to come into contact with us for six weeks. It makes it very awkward over food and shopping, not to mention missing her companionship. Coupuis is still in bed and has had nothing but porridge and milk for three weeks. Crawler is frantically busy. The Latin lessons Margot sends in are corrected by a teacher and returned, Margot writing in Ellie's name. The teacher is very nice and witty, too. I expect he's glad to have such a clever pupil. Dussel is very put out. None of us knows why. It began by his keeping his mouth closed upstairs. He didn't utter a word to either Mr. or Mrs. Von Don. Everyone was struck by it. And when it lasted a couple of days... Mummy took the opportunity of warning him about Mrs. Von Don, who, if he went on like this, could make things very disagreeable for him. Dussel said that Mr. Von Don started the silence, so he was not going to be the one to break it. Now I must tell you that yesterday was the 16th of November, the day he had exactly been one year in the secret annex. Mummy received a plant in honor of the occasion, but Mrs. Von Don, who for weeks beforehand had made no bones about the fact that she thought Dussel should treat us to something, received nothing. Instead of expressing for the first time his thanks for our unselfishness in taking him in, he didn't say a word. 
and when I asked him on the morning of the 16th whether I should congratulate or condole, he answered that it didn't matter to him. Mummy, who wanted to act as peacemaker, didn't get one step further, and finally the situation remained as it was. Der Mann hat einen großen Geist, und die so klein von Taten. Footnote. The spirit of the man is great. How puny are his deeds. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 27 November, 1943. Dear Kitty, Yesterday evening, before I fell asleep, who should suddenly appear before my eyes but Lee's? I saw her in front of me, clothed in rags, her face thin and worn. Her eyes were very big, and she looked so sadly and reproachfully at me that I could read in her eyes, Oh, Anna, why have you deserted me? Help, oh, help me, rescue me from this hell. And I cannot help her. I can only look on how others suffer and die and can only pray to God to send her back to us. I just saw Lee's, no one else, and now I understand. I misjudged her and was too young to understand her difficulties. She was attached to a new girlfriend, and to her it seemed as though I wanted to take her away. What the poor girl must have felt like, I know. I know the feeling so well myself. Sometimes, in a flash, I saw something of her life, but a moment later I was selfishly absorbed again in my own pleasures and problems. It was horrid of me to treat her as I did, and now she looked at me oh so helplessly with her pale face and imploring eyes, oh, God, if only that I, I should have me. all I could wish for and that she should be seized by such a terrible fate. I am not more virtuous than she. She too wanted to do what was right. Why should I be chosen to live and she probably to die? What was the difference between us? Why are we so far from each other now? Quite honestly, I haven't thought about her for months. Yes, almost a year. Not completely forgotten her, but still I had never thought about her like this until I saw her before me in all her misery. Oh, Lise, I hope that if you live until the end of the war, you will come back to us and that I shall be able to take you in and do something to make up for the wrong I did you. But when I am able to help her again, then she will not need my help so badly as now. I wonder if she ever thinks of me. If so, what would she feel? Good Lord, defend her so that at least she is not alone. Oh, if only you could tell her that I think lovingly of her and with sympathy, perhaps that would give her greater endurance. I must not go on thinking about it, because I don't get any further. I only keep seeing her great big eyes and cannot free myself from them. I wonder if Lise has real faith in herself and not only what has been thrust upon her. I don't even know. I never took the trouble to ask her. Lise, Lise, if only I could take you away. If only I could let you share all the things I enjoy. It is too late now. I can't help or repair the wrong I have done. But I shall never forget her again, and I shall always pray for her. Yours, Anna. Monday, 6 November, 1943. Dear Kitty, when St. Nicholas Day approached, none of us could help thinking of the prettily decorated basket we had last year, and I especially thought it would be very dull to do nothing at all this year. I thought a long time about it, until I invented something, something funny. I consulted Pym, and a week ago we started composing a little poem for each person. On Sunday evening, at a quarter to eight, we appeared upstairs with a large laundry basket between us, decorated with little figures and bows of pink and blue carbon copy paper. The basket was covered with a large piece of brown paper on which a letter was pinned. Everyone was rather astonished at the size of the surprise package. I took the letter from the paper and read, Santa Claus has come once more, though not quite as he came before. We can't celebrate his day in last year's fine and pleasant way, for then our hopes were high and bright. All the optimists seemed right, none supposing that this year we would welcome Santa here. Still, we'll make his spirit live, and since we've nothing left to give, we've thought of something else to do. Each please look inside his shoe." As each owner took his shoe from the basket, there was a resounding peal of laughter. A little paper package lay in each shoe with the address of the shoe's owner on it. Wednesday, yours 22 on. December 1943. Dear Kitty, a bad attack of flu has prevented me from riding you until today. 
It's wretched to be ill here. When I wanted to cough, one, two, three, I crawled under the blankets and tried to stifle the noise. Usually the only result was that the tickle wouldn't go away at all, and milk and honey, sugar or lozenges had to be brought into operation. It makes me dizzy to think of all the cures that were tried on me. Sweating, compresses, wet cloths on my chest, dry cloths on my chest, hot drinks, gargling, throat painting, lying still, cushion for extra warmth, hot water bottles, lemon squashes, and, in addition, the thermometer every two hours. Can anyone really get better like this? The worst moment of all was certainly when Mr. Dussel thought he'd play doctor and came and lay on my naked chest with his greasy head in order to listen to the sounds within. Not only did his hair tickle unbearably, but I was embarrassed, in spite of the fact that he once, thirty years ago, studied medicine and has the title of doctor. Why should the fellow come and lie on my heart? He's not my lover, after all. For that matter, he wouldn't hear whether it's healthy or unhealthy inside me anyway. His ears need syringing first, as he's becoming alarmingly hard of hearing. But that is enough about illness. I'm as fit as a fiddle again, one centimeter taller, two pounds heavier, pale and with a real appetite for learning. There is not much news to tell you. We are all getting on well together for a change. There's no quarreling. We haven't had such peace in the home for at least a half a year. Ellie is still parted from us. We received extra oil for Christmas, sweets and syrup. The chief present is a brooch made out of a two-and-a-half-cent piece and shining beautifully. Anyway, lovely but indescribable. Mr. Dussel gave Mummy and Mrs. Von Don a lovely cake which she had asked me up to bake for him. With all her work, she has to do that as well. I have also something for me up and Ellie. For at least two months I have saved the sugar from my porridge, you see, and with Mr. Coupuy's help, I'll have it made into fondance. It is drizzly weather. The stove smells, the food lies heavily on everyone's tummy, causing thunderous noises on all sides. The war at a standstill, morale Friday, rotten. 24 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, I have previously written about how much we are affected by atmospheres here, and I think that in my own case this trouble is getting much worse lately. Himmelhock Jokzend und zum Tode betrübt certainly fits here. Footnote. A famous line from Goethe, on top of the world or in the depths of despair. I am Himmelhock Jokzend, if I only think how lucky we are here compared with other Jewish children, and Zoom Tode Betrupt comes over me when, as it happened yesterday, for example, Mrs. Kupuis comes and tells us about her daughter Corey's hockey club, canoe trips, theatrical performances, and friends. I don't think I'm jealous of Corey, but I couldn't help feeling a great longing to have lots of fun myself for once, and to laugh until my tummy ached. Especially at this time of the year, with all the holidays for Christmas and the New Year, we are stuck here like outcasts. Still, I really ought not to write this, because it seems ungrateful and I've certainly been exaggerating. But still, whatever you think of me, I can't keep everything to myself, so I'll remind you of my opening words. Paper is patient. When someone comes in from outside with the wind in their clothes and the cold on their faces, then I could bury my head in the blankets to stop myself thinking, when will we be granted the privilege of smelling fresh air? And because I must not bury my head in the blankets, but the reverse, I must keep my head high and be brave. The thoughts will come not once, but oh, countless times. Believe me, if you have been shut up for a year and a half, it can get too much for you some days. In spite of all justice and thankfulness, you can't crush your feelings. Cycling, dancing, whistling, looking out into the world, feeling young, to know that I'm free. That's what I long for. Still, I mustn't show it, because I sometimes think if all eight of us began to pity ourselves or went about with discontented faces, where would it lead us? I sometimes ask myself, would anyone, either Jew or non-Jew, understand this about me? that I am simply a young girl badly in need of some rollicking fun? I don't know, and I couldn't talk about it to anyone, because then I know I should cry. Crying can bring such relief. In spite of all my theories and however much trouble I take, each day I miss having a real mother who understands me. 
That is why with everything I do and write, I think of the mumsy that I want to be for my children later on. The mumsy who doesn't take everything that is said in general conversation so seriously, but who does take what I say seriously. I have noticed, though I can't explain how, that the word mumsy tells you everything. Do you know what I found? To give me the feeling of calling mummy something which sounds like mumsy, I often call her mum. Then from that comes mums, the incomplete mumsy, as it were, whom I would so love to honor with the extra I.E., and yet who does not realize it. It's a good thing, because it would only make her unhappy. That's enough about that. Writing has made my Zoom toe de betrupt go off a bit. Saturday, 25 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, during these days, now that Christmas is here, I find myself thinking all the time about Pim and what he told me about the love of his youth. Last year I didn't understand the meaning of his words as well as I do now. If he'd only talk about it again, perhaps I would be able to show him that I understand. I believe that Pym talked about it because he who knows the secrets of so many other hearts had to express his own feelings for once, because otherwise Pym never says a word about himself, and I don't think Margot has any idea of all Pym has had to go through. Poor Pym, he can't make me think that he has forgotten everything. He will never forget this. He has become very tolerant. I hope that I shall grow a bit like him without having to go through all that. Yours, Anna. Monday, 27 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, on Friday evening, for the first time in my life, I received something for Christmas. Coupuis, Crawler, and the girls had prepared a lovely surprise again. Mia has made a lovely Christmas cake, on which was written Peace, 1944. Ellie had provided a pound of sweet biscuits of pre-war quality, for Paige and Margot and me, a bottle of yogurt and a bottle of beer for each of the grown-ups. Everything was so nicely done up, and there were pictures stuck on the different packages. Otherwise, Christmas passed by quickly for us. Yours, Anna. Wednesday, 29 December, 1943. Dear Kitty, I was very unhappy again last evening. Granny and Lees came into my mind. Granny, oh, darling Granny... How little we understood of what she suffered, or how sweet she was. And besides all this, she knew a terrible secret which she carefully kept to herself the whole time. Footnote, a severe internal disease. How faithful and good Granny always was. She would never have let one of us down. Whatever it was, however naughty I'd been, Granny always stuck up for me. Granny, did you love me, or didn't you understand me either? I don't know. No one ever talked about themselves to Granny. How lonely Granny must have been. How lonely in spite of us. A person can be lonely even if he is loved by many people, because he is still not the one and only to anyone. And Lise, is she still alive? What is she doing? Oh, God, protect her and bring her back to us. Lise, I see in you all the time what my lot might have been. I keep seeing myself in your place. Why, then, should I often be unhappy over what happens here? Shouldn't I always be glad, contented, and happy? Except when I think about her and her companions in distress. I am selfish and cowardly. Why do I always dream and think of the most terrible things? My fear makes me want to scream out loud sometimes. Because still, in spite of everything, I have not enough faith in God. He has given me so much, which I certainly do not deserve and I still do much that is wrong every day. If you think of your fellow creatures, then you only want to cry. You could really cry the whole day long. The only thing to do is to pray that God will perform a miracle and save some of them, and I hope that I am doing that enough. Sunday, 2 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, This morning when I had nothing to do, I turned over some of the pages of my diary and several times I came across letters dealing with the subject mummy in such a hot-headed way that I was quite shocked and asked myself, Anna, is it really you who mentioned hate? Oh, Anna, how could you? I remained sitting with the open page in my hand and thought about it 
and how it came about that I should have been so brimful of rage and really so filled with such a thing as hate that I had to confide it all in you. I have been trying to understand the Anna of a year ago, and to excuse her, because my conscience isn't clear as long as I have to leave you with these accusations, without being able to explain, on looking back, how it happened. I suffer now, and suffered then, from moods which kept my head under water, so to speak, and only allowed me to see the things subjectively, without enabling me to consider quietly the words of the other side, and to answer them as the words of one whom I, with my hot-headed temperament, had offended or made unhappy. I hid myself within myself. I only considered myself and quietly wrote down all my joys, sorrows, and contempt in my diary. This diary is of great value to me, because it has become a book of memoirs in many places, but on a good many pages I could certainly put past and done with. I used to be furious with Mummy, and still am sometimes. It's true that she doesn't understand me, but I don't understand her either. She did love me very much, and she was tender, but as she landed in so many unpleasant situations through me, and was nervous and irritable because of other worries and difficulties, it is certainly understandable that she snapped at me. I took it much too seriously, was offended, and was rude and aggravating to Mummy, which, in turn, made her unhappy. So it was really a matter of unpleasantness and misery rebounding all the time. It wasn't nice for either of us, but it is passing. I just didn't want to see all this, and pitied myself very much, but that too is understandable. Those violent outbursts on paper were only giving vent to anger, which, in a normal life, could have been worked off by stamping my feet a couple of times in a locked room, or calling Mummy names behind her back. The period when I caused Mummy to shed tears is over. I have grown wiser, and Mummy's nerves are not so much on edge. I usually keep my mouth shut if I get annoyed, and so does she, so we appear to get on much better together. I can't really love Mummy in a dependent, childlike way. I just don't have that feeling. I soothe my conscience now with the thought that it is better for hard words to be on paper than that Mummy should carry them in her heart. Wednesday, Yours, Anna. 5 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, I have two things to confess to you today, which will take a long time, but I must tell someone, and you are the best one to tell, as I know that, come what may, you always keep a secret. The first is about Mummy. You know that I've grumbled a lot about Mummy, yet still tried to be nice to her again. Now it is suddenly clear to me what she lacks. Mummy herself has told us that she looked upon us more as her friends than her daughters. Now that is all very fine, but still a friend can't take a mother's place. I need my mother as an example which I can follow. I want to be able to respect her. I have the feeling that Margot thinks differently about these things and would never be able to understand what I've just told you, and Daddy avoids all arguments about Mummy. I imagine a mother as a woman who, in the first place, shows great tact, especially toward her children when they reach our age, and who does not laugh at me if I cry about something, not pain, but other things, like Mom's does. One thing, which perhaps may seem rather fatuous, I have never forgiven her. It was on a day that I had to go to the dentist. Mummy and Margo were going to come with me and agreed that I should take my bicycle. When we had finished at the dentist and were outside again, Margo and Mummy told me that they were going into the town to look at something or buy something. I don't remember exactly what. I wanted to go too, but was not allowed to as I had my bicycle with me. Tears of rage sprang into my eyes, and Mummy and Margo began laughing at me. Then I became so furious that I stuck my tongue out at them in the street, just as an old woman happened to pass by, who looked very shocked. I rode home on my bicycle, and I know I cried for a long time. It is queer that the wound that Mummy made then still burns when I think of how angry I was that afternoon. The second is something that is very difficult to tell you because it is about myself. Yesterday, I read an article about blushing by Sis Heister, this article might have been addressed to me personally. Although I don't blush very easily, the other things in it certainly all fit me. She writes roughly something like this, that a girl in the years of puberty becomes quiet within and begins to think about the wonders that are happening to her body. I experienced that too, 
and that is why I get the feeling lately of being embarrassed about Margot, Mummy, and Daddy. Funnily enough, Margot, who is much more shy than I am, isn't at all embarrassed. I think what is happening to me is so wonderful, and not only what can be seen on my body, but all that is taking place inside. I never discuss myself or any of these things with anybody. That is why I have to talk to myself about them. Each time I have a period, and that has only been three times, I have the feeling that in spite of all the pain, unpleasantness, and nastiness, I have a sweet secret, and that is why, although it is nothing but a nuisance to me in a way, I always long for the time that I should feel that Sis secret Heister within me again. also writes that girls of this age don't feel quite certain of themselves and discover that they themselves are individuals with ideas, thoughts, and habits. After I came here when I was just fourteen, I began to think about myself sooner than most girls and to know that I am a person. Sometimes when I lie in bed at night, I have a terrible desire to feel my breasts and to listen to the quiet rhythmic beat of my heart. I already had these kinds of feelings subconsciously before I came here, because I remember that once when I slept with a girlfriend, I had a strong desire to kiss her, and that I did so. I could not help being terribly inquisitive over her body, for she had always kept it hidden from me. I asked her whether, as proof of our friendship, we should feel one another's breasts, but she refused. I go into ecstasies every time I see the naked figure of a woman, such as Venus, for example. It strikes me as so wonderful and exquisite that I have difficulty in stopping the tears rolling down my cheeks. If only I had a girlfriend. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 6 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, my longing to talk to someone became so intense that somehow or other I took it into my head to choose Pater. Sometimes, if I've been upstairs into Pater's room during the day, it always struck me as very snug, but because Pater is so retiring and one would never turn anyone out who became a nuisance, I never dared stay long, because I was afraid he might think me a bore. I tried to think of an excuse to stay in his room and get him talking without it being too noticeable, and my chance came yesterday. Pater has a mania for crossword puzzles at the moment and hardly does anything else. I helped him with them, and we soon sat opposite each other at his little table, he on the chair and me on the divan. He gave me a queer feeling each time I looked into his deep blue eyes, and he sat there with that mysterious laugh playing round his lips. I was able to read his inward thoughts. I could see on his face that look of helplessness and uncertainty as how to behave, and at the same time a trace of his sense of manhood. I noticed his shy manner, and it made me feel very gentle. I couldn't refrain from meeting those dark eyes again and again, and with my whole heart I almost beseeched him, Oh, tell me, what is going on inside you? Oh, can't you look beyond this ridiculous chatter? But the evening passed, and nothing happened, except that I told him about blushing, naturally not what I have written, but just so that he would become more sure of himself as he grew older. When I lay in bed and thought over the whole situation, I found it far from encouraging, and the idea that I should beg for Pater's patronage was simply repellent. One can do a lot to satisfy one's longings, which certainly sticks out in my case, for I have made up my mind to go and sit with Pater more often and to get him talking somehow or other. Whatever you do, don't think I'm in love with Pater, not a bit of it. If the Von Dons had had a daughter instead of a son, I should have tried to make I friends with her I woke at about too. five to seven this morning and knew at once, quite positively, what I had dreamed. I sat on a chair, and opposite me sat Pater, Vessel. We were looking together at a book of drawings by Mary Boss. The dream was so vivid that I can still partly remember the drawings. But that was not all. The dream went on. Suddenly... Pater's eyes met mine, and I looked into those fine, velvet-brown eyes for a long time. Then Pater said very softly, If I had only known, I would have come to you long before. I turned around brusquely because the emotion was too much for me. And after that I felt a soft and, oh, such a cool, kind cheek against mine, and it felt so good, so good. I awoke at this point, while I could still feel his cheek against mine, and felt his brown eyes looking deep into my heart, so deep that there he read how much I had loved him, 
and how much I still love him. Tears sprang into my eyes once more, and I was very sad that I had lost him again, but at the same time glad because it made me feel quite certain that Pater was still the chosen one. It is strange that I should often see such vivid images in my dreams here. First, I saw Grandma so clearly one night that I could even distinguish her thick, soft, wrinkled, velvety skin. Footnote. Grandma is grandmother on father's side, granny on mother's side. Then Granny appeared as a guardian angel. Then followed Lise, who seems to be a symbol to me of all the sufferings of all my girlfriends and all Jews. When I pray for her, I pray for all Jews and all those in need. And now Pater, my darling Pater, never before have I had such a clear picture of him in my mind. I don't need a photo of him. I can see him before my eyes and oh so well. Yours, Anna. Friday, 7 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, what a silly ass I am. I am quite forgetting that I have never told you the history of myself and all my boyfriends. When I was quite small, I was even still at a kindergarten, I became attached to Carol Sampson. He had lost his father, and he and his mother lived with an aunt. One of Carol's cousins, Robbie, was a slender, good-looking dark boy, who aroused more admiration than the little humorous fellow, Carol. But looks did not count with me, and I was very fond of Carol for years. We used to be together a lot for quite a long time, but for the rest, my love was unreturned. Then Pater crossed my path, and in my childish way I really fell in love. He liked me very much, too, and we were inseparable for one whole summer. I can still remember us walking hand in hand through the streets together, he in a cotton-white suit and me in a short summer dress. At the end of the summer holidays, he went into the first form of the high school and I into the sixth form of the lower school. He used to meet me from school and vice versa. I would meet him. Pater was a very good-looking boy, tall, handsome, and slim, with an earnest, calm, intelligent face. He had dark hair and wonderful brown eyes, ruddy cheeks and a pointed nose, I was mad about his laugh above all when he looked so for the holidays. When I returned, Pater had in the meantime moved, and a much older boy lived in the same house. He apparently drew Pater's attention to the fact that I was a childish little imp, and Pater gave me up. I adored him so that I didn't want to face the truth. I tried to hold on to him until it dawned on me that if I went on running after him, I should soon get the name of being boy mad. The years passed. Pater went around with girls of his own age and didn't even think of saying hello to me anymore. But I couldn't forget him. I went to the Jewish secondary school. Lots of boys in our class were keen on me. I thought it was fun, felt honored, but was otherwise quite untouched. Then later on, Harry was mad about me, but, as I've already told you, I never fell in love again. There is a saying, time heals all wounds, and so it was with me. I imagined that I had forgotten Pater and that I didn't like him a bit any more. The memory of him, however, lived so strongly in my subconscious mind that I admitted to myself sometimes I was jealous of the other girls, and that was why I didn't like him any more. This morning I knew that nothing has changed. On the contrary, as I grew older and more mature, my love grew with me. I can quite understand now that Pater thought me childish, and yet it still hurt that he had so completely forgotten me. His face was shown so clearly to me, and now I know that no one else could remain with me like he does. I am completely upset by the dream. When Daddy kissed me this morning, I could have cried out, Oh, if only you were Pater. I think of him all the time, and I keep repeating to myself the whole day, Oh, Pater, darling, darling Pater, who can help me now? I must live on and pray to God that he will let Pater cross my path when I come out of here, and that when he reads the love in my eyes, he will say, Oh, Anna, if I had only known, I would have come to you long before. I saw my face in the mirror, and it looks quite different. My eyes look so clear and deep. My cheeks are pink, which they haven't been for weeks. My mouth is much softer. I look as if I am happy, and yet there is something so sad in my expression and my smile slips away from my lips as soon as it has come. I'm not happy, 
because I might know that Pater's thoughts are not with me. And yet I still feel his wonderful eyes upon me and his cool, soft cheek against mine. Oh, Pater, Pater, how will I ever free myself of your image? Wouldn't any other in your place be a miserable substitute? I love you, and with such a great love that it can't grow in my heart any more, but has to leap out into the open and suddenly manifest itself in such a devastating way. A week ago, even yesterday, if anyone had asked me, which of your friends do you consider would be the most suitable to marry? I would have answered, I don't know. But now I would cry, Patel, because I love him with all my heart and soul. I give myself completely. But one thing, he may touch my face, but no more. Once when we spoke about sex, Daddy told me that I couldn't possibly understand the longing yet. I always knew that I did understand it, and now I understand it fully. Nothing is so beloved to me now as he, my Patel. Wednesday, yours, 12 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, Ellie has been back a fortnight. Miep and Hank were away from their work for two days. They both had tummy upsets. I have a craze for dancing and ballet at the moment and practice dance steps every evening diligently. I have made a super modern dance frock from a light blue petticoat edged with lace belonging to Mansa. A ribbon is threaded through round the top and ties in a bow in the center, and a pink corded ribbon completes the creation. I tried in vain to convert my gym shoes into real ballet shoes. My stiff limbs are well on the way to becoming supple again like they used to be. One terrific exercise is to sit on the floor, hold a heel in each hand, and then lift both legs up in the air. I have to have a cushion under me, otherwise my poor little behind has a rough time. Everyone here is reading the book Cloudless Morn. Mummy thought it exceptionally good. There are a lot of youth problems in it. I thought to myself rather ironically, take a bit more trouble with your own young people first. I believe Mummy thinks there could be no better relationship between parents and their children, and that no one could take a greater interest in their children's lives than she. But quite definitely she only looks at Margot, who I don't think ever had such problems and thoughts as I do. Still, I wouldn't dream of pointing out to Mummy that, in the case of her daughters, it isn't at all as she imagines— because she would be utterly amazed and wouldn't know how to change anyway. I want to save her the unhappiness it would cause her, especially as I know that, for me, everything would remain the same anyway. Mummy certainly feels that Margot loves her much more than I do, but she thinks that this just goes in phases. Margot has grown so sweet. She seems quite different from what she used to be, isn't nearly so catty these days, and is becoming a real friend— nor does she any longer regard me as a little kid who counts for nothing. I have an odd way of sometimes, as it were, being able to see myself through someone else's eyes. Then I view the affairs of a certain Anna at my ease and browse through the pages of her life as if she were a stranger. Before we came here, when I didn't think about things as much as I do now, I used at times to have the feeling that I didn't belong to Mansa Pym and Margot, and that I would always be a bit of an outsider. Sometimes I used to pretend I was an orphan, until I reproached and punished myself, telling myself it was all my own fault that I played this self-pitying role when I was really so fortunate. Then came the time that I used to force myself to be friendly. Every morning, as soon as someone came downstairs, I hoped that it would be Mummy who would say good morning to me. I greeted her warmly because I really longed for her to look lovingly at me, then she made some remark or other that seemed unfriendly, and I would go off to school, again feeling thoroughly disheartened. On the way home, I would make excuses for her because she had so many worries. Arrive home very cheerful, chatter nineteen to the dozen, until I began repeating myself, and left the room wearing a pensive expression, my satchel under my arm. Sometimes I decided to remain cross— but when I came home from school, I always had so much news that my resolutions were gone with the wind, and Mummy, whatever she might be doing, had to lend an ear to all my adventures. Then the time came once more when I didn't listen for footsteps on the staircase any longer, and at night my pillow was wet with tears. Everything grew much worse at that point. Enfin, you know all about it. Now God has sent me a helper, Pater, I just clasp my pendant, kiss it, and think to myself, 
What do I care about the lot of them? Peter belongs to me, and no one knows anything about it. This way I can get over all the snubs I receive. Who would ever think that so much can go on in the soul of a young girl? Saturday, Yours 15 honor. January, 1944. Dear Kitty, there's no point in telling you every time the exact details of our rows and arguments. Let it suffice to tell you that we have divided up a great many things, such as butter and meat, and that we fry our own potatoes. For some time now, we've been eating whole meal bread between meals as an extra, because by four o'clock in the afternoon, we are longing for our supper so much that we hardly know how to control our rumbling tummies. Mummy's birthday is rapidly approaching. She got some extra sugar from Crawler, which made the Von Dons jealous, as Mrs. Von Don had not been favored in this way for her birthday. But what's the use of annoying each other with yet more unkind words, tears, and angry outbursts? You can be sure of one thing, Kitty, that we are even more fed up with them than ever. Mummy has expressed the wish, one which cannot come true just now, not to see the Von Dons for a fortnight. I keep asking myself whether one would have trouble in the long run whoever one shared a house with, or did we strike it extra unlucky? Are most people so selfish and stingy then? I think it's all to the good to have learned a bit about human beings, but now I think I've learned enough. The world goes on just the same, whether or not we choose to quarrel or long for freedom and fresh air, and so we should try to make the best of our stay here. Now I'm preaching, but I also believe that if I stay here for very long, I shall grow into a dried-up old beanstalk. And I did so want to grow into a real young woman. Yours, Anna. Saturday, 22 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, I wonder whether you can tell me why it is that people always try so hard to hide their real feelings— how is it that I always behave quite differently from what I should in other people's company? Why do we trust one another so little? I know there must be a reason, but still I sometimes think it's horrible that you find you can never really confide in people, even in those who are nearest to you. It seems as if I've grown up a lot since my dream the other night. I'm much more of an independent being. You'll certainly be amazed when I tell you that even my attitude towards the Van Dons has changed— I suddenly see all the arguments and the rest of it in a different light, and am not as prejudiced as I was. How can I have changed so much? Yes, you see, it suddenly struck me that if Mummy had been different, a real Mumsy, the relationship might have been quite different. It's true that Mrs. Von Don is by no means a nice person, but still, I do think that half the quarrels could be avoided if it weren't for the fact that when the conversation gets tricky... Mummy is a bit difficult has too. one good side, and that is that you can talk to her. Despite all her selfishness, stinginess, and underhandedness, you can make her give in easily, as long as you don't irritate her and get on the wrong side of her. This way doesn't work every time, but if you have patience, you can try again and see how far you get. All the problems of our upbringing, of our being spoiled, the food, it could have been quite different if we'd remain perfectly open and friendly and not always only on the lookout for something to seize on. I know exactly what you'll say, Kitty. But, Anna, do these words really come from your lips? From you who have had to listen to so many harsh words from the people upstairs? From you, the girl who has suffered so many injustices? And yet they come from me. I want to start afresh, and try to get to the bottom of it all, not be like the saying, the young always follow a bad example. I want to examine the whole matter carefully myself and find out what is true and what is exaggerated. Then, if I myself am disappointed in them, I can adopt the same lines as Mummy and Daddy. If not, I shall try first of all to make them alter their ideas, and if I don't succeed, I shall stick to my own opinions and judgment. I shall seize every opportunity to discuss openly all our points of argument with Mrs. Van Don and not be afraid of declaring myself neutral, even at the cost of being called a know-it-all. It is not that I shall be going against my own family, but from today there will be no more unkind gossip on my part. Until now I was immovable. I always thought the Von Dons were in the wrong, but we too are partly to blame. We have certainly been right over the subject matter, 
But handling of others from intelligent people, which we consider ourselves to be, one expects more insight. I hope that I have acquired a bit of insight and will use it well when the occasion arises. Yours, Anna. Monday, 24 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, Something has happened to me, or rather I can hardly describe it as an event, except that I think it is pretty crazy. Whenever anyone used to speak of sexual problems at home or at school, it was something either mysterious or revolting. Words which had any bearing on the subject were whispered, and often if someone didn't understand, he was laughed at. It struck me as very odd, and I thought, why are these people so secretive and tiresome when they talk about these things? But as I didn't think that I could change things, I kept my mouth shut as much as possible, or sometimes asked girlfriends for information. When I had learned quite a lot, and had also spoken about it with my parents, Mummy said one day, Anna, let me give you some good advice. Never speak about this subject to boys, and don't reply if they begin about it. I remember exactly what my answer was. I said, no, of course not, the very idea. When we first came and there, there Daddy often told me about things that I would really have preferred to hear from Mummy, and I found out the rest from books and things I picked up from conversations. Peter von Don was never as tiresome over this as the boys at school, once or twice at first, perhaps, but he never tried to get me talking. Mrs. Von Don told us that she had never talked about these things to Pater, and for all she knew, neither had her husband. Apparently, she didn't even know how much he knew. Yesterday, when Margot, Pater, and I were peeling potatoes, somehow the conversation turned to Bosch. We still don't know what sex Bosch is, do we? I asked. Yes, certainly, Pater answered. He's a Tom. I began to laugh. A tomcat that's expecting. That's marvelous. Pater and Margot laughed too over this silly mistake. You see, two months ago, Pater had stated that Bosch would soon be having a family. Her tummy was growing visibly. However, the fatness appeared to come from the many stolen bones, because the children didn't seem to grow fast, let alone make their appearance. Pater just had to defend himself. No, he said. You can go with me yourself to look at him. Once, when I was playing around with him, I noticed quite clearly that he's a Tom. I couldn't control my curiosity and went with him to the warehouse. Bosch, however, was not receiving visitors and was nowhere to be seen. We waited for a while, began to get cold, and went upstairs again. Later in the afternoon, I heard Pater go downstairs for the second time. I mustered up all my courage to walk through the silent house alone and reach the warehouse. Bosch stood on the packing table playing with Pater, who had just put him on the scales to weigh him. Hello, do you want to see him? He didn't make any lengthy preparations, but picked up the animal, turned him over onto his back, deftly held his head and paws together, and the lesson began. Those are the male organs, these are just a few stray hairs, and that is his bottom. The cat did another half turn and was standing on his white socks once more. If any other boy had shown me the male organs, I would never have looked at him again. But Pater went on talking quite normally on what is otherwise such a painful subject, without meaning anything unpleasant, and finally put me sufficiently at my ease for me to be normal too. We played with Bosch, amused ourselves, chattered together, and then sauntered through the large warehouse towards the door. Usually, when I want to know something, I find it in some book or other, don't you? I asked. Why on earth? I just ask upstairs. My father knows more than me and has had more experience in such things. We were already on the stairs, so I kept my mouth shut after that. Things may alter, as Br'er Rabbit said. Yes. Really, I shouldn't have discussed these things in such a normal way with a girl. I know too definitely that Mummy didn't mean it that way when she warned me not to discuss the subject with boys. I wasn't quite my usual self for the rest of the day, though, in spite of everything. When I thought over our talk, it still seemed rather odd. But at least I'm wiser about one thing, that there really are young people, and of the opposite sex, too, who can discuss these things naturally, without making fun of them. 
I wonder if Peter really does ask his parents much. Would he honestly behave with them as he did with me yesterday? Ah, uh, what would I know about Thursday, it? Thursday, 27 Yours January, 1944. Dear Kitty, Lately I have developed a great love for family trees and genealogical tables of the royal families and have come to the conclusion that once you begin, you want to delve still deeper into the past and can keep on making fresh and interesting discoveries. Although I am extraordinarily industrious over my lessons and can already follow the English home service quite well on the wireless, I still devote many Sundays to sorting and looking over my large collection of film stars, which is quite a respectable size by now. I am awfully pleased whenever Mr. Crawler brings the cinema and theater with him on Mondays. Although this little gift is often called a waste of money by the less worldly members of the household, they are amazed each time at how accurately I can state who is in a certain film, even after a year. Ellie, who on her days off often goes to the movies with her boyfriend, tells me the titles of the new films each week, and in one breath I rattle off the names of the stars who appear in them, together with what the reviews say. Not so long ago, Mom said that I wouldn't need to go to a cinema later on because I knew the plots, the names of the stars, and the opinions of the reviews all by heart. If ever I come sailing in with a new hairstyle, they all look disapprovingly at me, and I can be quite sure that someone will ask which glamorous star I'm supposed to be imitating. They only half believe me if I reply that it's my own invention. But to continue about the hairstyle, it doesn't stay put for more than half an hour. Then I'm so tired of the remarks people pass that I quickly hasten to the bathroom and restore my ordinary house garden kitchen hairstyle. Yours, Anna. Friday, 28 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, I asked myself this morning whether you don't sometimes feel rather like a cow who has had to chew over all the old pieces of news again and again, and who finally yawns loudly and silently wishes that Anna would occasionally dig up something new. Alas, I know it's dull for you, but try to put yourself in my place. And imagine how sick I am of the old cows who keep having to be pulled out of the ditch again. If the conversation at mealtimes isn't over politics or a delicious meal, then Mummy or Mrs. Von Don trot out one of the old stories of their youth, which we've heard so many times before. Or Dussel twaddles on about his wife's extensive wardrobe, beautiful racehorses, leaking rowboats, boys who can swim at the age of four, muscular pains and nervous patients, what it all boils down to is this, that if one of the eight of us opens his mouth, the other seven can finish the story for him. We all know the point of every joke from the start, and the storyteller is alone in laughing at his witticisms. The various milkmen, grocers, and butchers of the two ex-housewives have already grown beards in our minds, so often have they been praised to the skies or pulled to pieces. It is impossible for anything in the conversation here to be fresh or new. Still, all this would be bearable if the grown-ups didn't have their little way of telling the stories with which Coupuis, Hank, or Miep obliged the company, ten times over, and adding their own little frills and furbelows so that I often have to pinch my arm under the table to prevent myself from putting them right. Little children such as Anna must never, under any circumstances, know better than the grown-ups, however many blunders they make and to whatever extent they allow their imagination One subject of Coupuises and Hanks is that of people in hiding and in the underground movement. They know very well that anything to do with other people in hiding interests us tremendously, and how deeply we can sympathize with the sufferings of people who get taken away and rejoice with the liberated prisoner. We are quite as used to the idea of going into hiding or underground as in bygone days when was used to Daddy's bedroom slippers warming in front of the fire— there are a great number of organizations such as the Free Netherlands, which forge identity cards, supply money to people underground, find hiding places for people, and work for young men in hiding. And it is amazing how much noble, unselfish work these people are doing, risking their own lives to help and save others. Our helpers are a very good example. They have pulled us through up till now, and we hope they will bring us safely to dry land. Otherwise, they will have to share the same fate as the many others who are being searched for. Never have we heard one word of the burden which we certainly must be to them. Never has one of them complained of all the trouble we give. They all come upstairs every day, 
talk to the men about business and politics, to the women about food and wartime difficulties, and about newspapers and books with the children. They put on the brightest possible faces, bring flowers and presents for birthdays and bank holidays, are always ready to help and do all they can. That is something we must never forget. Although others may show heroism in the war or against the Germans, our helpers display heroism in their cheerfulness and affection. The wildest tales are going round, but still they are usually founded on fact. For instance, Coupuis told us this week that in Gelderland two football elevens met, and one side consisted solely of members of the underground, and the other was made up of members of the police. New ration books are being handed out in Hilversum. In order that the many people in hiding may also draw rations, the officials have given instructions to those of them in the district to come at a certain time so that they can collect their documents from a separate little table. Still, they'll have to be careful that such impudent tricks do not reach the ears of the Germans. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 3 February, 1944. Dear Kitty, Invasion fever in the country is mounting daily. If you were here, on the one hand, you would probably feel the effect of all these preparations just as I do, and on the other, you would laugh at us for making such a fuss. Who knows, perhaps for nothing. All the newspapers are full of the invasion, and are driving people mad by saying that, in the event of the English landing in Holland, the Germans will do all they can to defend the country. If necessary, they will resort to flooding. With this, maps have been published, on which the parts of Holland that will be under water are marked. As this applies to large parts of Amsterdam, the first question was, what shall we do if the water in the streets rises to one meter? The answers given by as different people cycling is out of the question. We shall have to wade through the stagnant water. Of course not, but we'll have to try and swim. We shall all put on our bathing suits and caps and swim underwater as much as possible. Then no one will see that we are Jews. Oh, what nonsense! I'd like to see the ladies swimming if the rats started biting their legs. That was naturally a man. Just see who screams the loudest. We shan't be able to get out of the house anyway. The warehouse will definitely collapse if there is a flood. It is so wobbly already. Listen, folks, all joking apart, we shall try and get a boat. Why bother? I know something much better. We each get hold of a wooden packing case from the attic and row with a soup ladle. I shall walk on stilts. I used to be an expert at it in my youth. Hank Van Satten won't need to. He's sure to take his wife on his back, then she'll be on stilts. This gives you a rough idea, doesn't it, Kit? This chatter is all very amusing, but the truth may be otherwise. A second question about the invasion was bound to arise. What do we do if the Germans evacuate Amsterdam? Leave the city, too, and disguise ourselves as best we can. Don't go. Whatever happens, stay put. The only thing to do is to remain here. The Germans are quite capable of driving the whole population right into Germany, where they will all die. Yes, naturally we shall stay here, since this is the safest place. We'll try and fetch Coupuis and his family over here to come and live with us. We'll try and get hold of a sack of wood wool, then we can sleep on the floor. Let's ask me up and Coupuis to start bringing blankets here. We'll order some extra corn in addition to our sixty pounds. Let's get Hank to try and obtain more peas and beans. We have about sixty pounds of beans and ten pounds of peas in the house at present. Don't forget that we've got fifty tins of vegetables. Mummy, just count up how much we've got of other food, will you? Ten tins of fish, forty tins of milk, ten kilos of milk powder, three bottles of salad oil, four preserving jars of butter, four ditto of meat, two wicker-covered bottles of strawberries, two bottles of raspberries, twenty bottles of tomatoes, ten pounds of rolled oats, eight pounds of rice, and that's all. Our stock's not too bad, but if you think that we may be having visitors as well and drawing from reserves each week, then it seems more than it actually is. We have sufficient coal and firewood in the house, also candles. Let's all make little money bags, which could easily be hidden in our clothing, in case we want to take money with us. We'll make lists of the most important things to take, should we have to run for it, and pack rucksacks now in readiness. If it gets that far, we'll put two people on watch, one in the front and one in the back loft. 
I say, what's the use of collecting such stocks of food if we haven't any water, gas, or electricity? Then we must cook on the stove, filter and boil our water. We'll clean out some large wicker bottles and store water I hear nothing but this sort of talk the whole day long. Invasion, and nothing but invasion. Arguments about suffering from hunger, dying, bombs, fire extinguishers, sleeping bags, Jewish vultures, poisonous gases, etc., etc., None of it is exactly cheering. The gentlemen in the secret annex give pretty straightforward warnings. An example is the following conversation with Hank. Secret annex. We are afraid that if the Germans withdraw, they will take the whole population with them. Hank. That is impossible. They haven't the trains at their disposal. S.A. Trains. Do you really think they'd put civilians in carriages? Out of the question... They could use Shank's mare. Perpetes Apostolorum Dussel always says. H. I don't believe a word of it. You look on the black side of everything. What would be their object in driving all the civilians along with them? S.A. Didn't you know that Goebbels said, If we have to withdraw, we shall slam the doors of all the occupied countries behind us. H. They have said so much already. S.A. Do you think the Germans are above doing such a thing, or too humane? What they think is this. If we have got to go down, then everybody in our clutches will go down with us. H. Tell that to the Marines. I just don't believe it. S.A. It's always the same song. No one will see danger approaching until it is actually on top of him. H. But you know nothing definite. You just simply suppose... S.A. We have all been through it ourselves, first in Germany and then here, and what is going on in Russia? H. You mustn't include the Jews. I don't think anyone knows what is going on in Russia. The English and the Russians are sure to exaggerate things for propaganda purposes, just like the Germans. S.A. Out of the question. The English have always told the truth over the wireless. And suppose they do exaggerate the news— the facts are bad enough anyway, because you can't deny that many millions of peace-loving people were just simply murdered or gassed in Poland and Russia. I will spare you further examples of these conversations. I myself keep very quiet and don't take any notice of all the fuss and excitement. I have now reached the stage that I don't care much whether I live or die. The world will still keep on turning without me. What is going to happen will happen. And anyway, it's no good to resist. I trust to luck and do nothing but work, hoping that all will end well. Yours, Anna. This ends disc four. 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 Disc four.